Welcome to On the Right Side with GOGOP. I'm Al Hassinger, Activities VP for the Greater Oakland Republican Club. Thank you for joining us. Tonight we have the Republican candidates for the 8th Congressional District of Michigan with us. The 8th Congressional District represents all of Ingham, Livingston, and the northern parts of Oakland County, also representing approximately 700,000 uh, Michiganders. Uh, we have the candidates with us tonight, Nikki Snyder, Christina Like, Paul Young, and Alan Hoover. Mike Detmer, who's also running, could not join us tonight, and we're hoping that everything's fine. Uh, Christine, uh, Cindy Holland, excuse me, called us and told us he wouldn't be attending, but we're hoping he'll attend future GOGOP meetings. Um, the Republican primary is August 4th, and one of our guests tonight is going to be running against uh, Alyssa Slotkin on November 3rd. Uh, tonight we're having a round table, not so much of a debate, uh, but where the candidates are going to be asked questions, they're going to be giving two minutes to answer and a chance for other candidates to chime in and rebut, um, but not to uh, confront people directly. We're going to stick to the topic at hand with certain guideposts. Um, so let's uh, meet our candidates. They each have two minutes to introduce themselves. Nikki, why don't we start with you? Good evening. It's wonderful to be here. My name is Nikki Snyder, and I am running for Congress. I'm running to represent and to serve the great people of Michigan's 8th Congressional District. I have strong conservative values, including lower taxes, limited government, pro-Second Amendment support, and I'm one of the most passionate pro-life Republican women you will meet. I'm a nurse, and I've spent 18 years in healthcare. I've also been a nurse educator. In 2016, I was elected as a member of the State Board of Education, where I've served conservative principles since then as well, as parental rights, local control, freedom, and excellence in education. We turned Michigan red in 2016, and I believe we're gonna turn Michigan red again in 2020. It's time for new leadership in the 8th District and to take our seat back. I'm the candidate to do that. I'm looking forward to the conversation tonight. Thank you very much, Nikki. Christina Like. Good evening, my name is Christina Like, and that's like, like Michigan likes like, spelled with a Y though instead of an I. And thank you for um, putting this on for us tonight. We appreciate that very much. First of all, I would like to tell you where I come from. I grew up in the state of Michigan. I grew up in the village of Pinckney for, um, until, I was, until I graduated from high school, excuse me. Um, I graduated in 1994. My parents are two loving parents. Um, my dad was a gun dealer, local gun dealer, and he was also um, a local fire department man. He was also a UPS man. So, um, and my mom taught me uh, the values of faith, uh, the First Amendment. So we moved to Holt to, so I could attend high school, or excuse me, attend law school, and at Thomas Cooley Law School. I graduated there with a major in um, litigation and in international law. I served a lot of people during the time period of living in the community. I'm running for Congress because of the fact of my service to the community. When I was in law school, I learned that I wanted to become an attorney. I thought I wanted to be a corporate attorney, but instead I became a family law attorney and a criminal defense attorney. And I've been practicing law for about 15 years. After I graduated from law school, I opened up a small business in Old Town. And what happened was, is I had a small business for quite some time period. And then I moved to East Lansing and developed a, a bigger office. I'm doing very well. But the thing of it is, is I want the people to know that I'm running for Congress because I'm one of the forgotten men, that what Trump says. And I didn't receive a trust fund. I didn't receive any monies or anything of that nature. I did it all on my own and did it by persistence and perseverance. And that's what I'm gonna do as your Congresswoman and persevere and make sure that I do everything in my power to be the right one for you. So I'm running for Congress because I believe I'm the best candidate. Thank you, Christina. Paul Young. Uh, thank you, Al. Uh, my name is Paul Young, and maybe I should spell that. It's J-U-N-G-E. When I was a kid, my, uh, my friends used to call me Jungie, uh, but it is, in fact, Paul Young. And thank you for tuning in and watching today. As I've been campaigning, uh, I think I may have a suspicion about why it is that you're tuning in to see this uh, roundtable tonight. 
If you're like the voters I've been meeting, it's because you are very unhappy with the representation you're getting here in the 8th District in Washington, D.C. You may remember the candidate who is representing us now promised that she was not involved in or would not be involved in impeachment. She made promises that she would approach things in a bipartisan fashion. That's been exposed as a fraud. And that's what I'm hearing from voters all across the 8th District is anger and disgust with the representation and a strong desire to see change. We need to make Alyssa Slotkin a one-term member of Congress. And I appreciate the opportunity to explain to you and, and ask for your support and suggest that I am the candidate that has the best chance to make Alyssa Slotkin a one-term member of Congress. So I'll take advantage of this opportunity and tell you a little bit about myself. I am a Michigan native. I am a lifelong Republican. And I voted my first election for president for Ronald Reagan. Uh, I've worked in my family business. My family business maintained military family housing. And so as a child, we moved quite a bit. And even as an adult working in that family business, I moved quite a bit. Uh, I'm also a former prosecutor. I was a deputy district attorney. And my specialty eventually became domestic violence, where when I was in a courtroom, I was protecting battered women and abused children. Most recently, I've been in Washington, D.C. It was my pleasure to serve in the Trump administration at the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. And in that capacity, I was working with the president to secure our border and enforce our immigration laws. This is an important election. We must reelect President Trump. We must make the House Republican again. And I appreciate, I appreciate the opportunity to demonstrate and explain why I'm the best candidate to get that done. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Alan Hoover. Good evening, fellow American citizens and fellow veterans. I'm Alan Hoover, and I'm running for Congress in the 8th District against Alyssa Slocken. Look, I've been a Michigan resident my entire life. I was born to a poor mother, raised by a single mother with two younger sisters in 16 different cities across the great state of Michigan, all the way from Holly down to southwest Detroit. I also grew up in shelters, as well as being awarded the state in foster care for five years. With that, I attended 16 different schools, but I still managed to graduate. I know what it's like to grow up without electricity as a child because I've been there. I know what it's like not to have food on the table as a child because I've also experienced that. In high school, I had to drop out for a year to help earn income so that my mother could turn the electricity on and put food on the table for my younger sisters. I do know what it's about when it comes to working hard and I know what it means to finish things because I went back to high school and I finished my diploma. And upon graduating from high school, I went straight in the United States Marine Corps, to which I served in the Marine Corps for 20 years. And with that 20 years, I volunteered for five deployments as a communications chief and a special operations expeditionary warfare advisor. I've operated in 19 countries. I've served our country for 20 years as a United States Marine. In addition to that, I've been a union worker. I also worked at UPS as a union worker for a year, and then I was promoted in the management. I've been in Fortune 500 companies as an engineer in Big Three, and I've also worked in program development. At the end of the day, a U.S. representative is supposed to represent the voice of the American citizen. And I'm asking you to give me the opportunity to earn your trust to be your U.S. representative to restore your voice in the halls of Congress, to make sure that special interest groups and foreign countries aren't put ahead of the American citizen. God bless you, thank you, and I wish you the best. Thank you, Alan. Thank you all for staying up to about two minutes. Um, at this point, we're gonna get into our topics and uh, start with the economy, uh, certainly on everybody's mind right now. And um, for this first question out of the gate, let's start with Nikki Snyder. Nikki, how would you retain and bring jobs back to the U.S.? And also, you, uh, also other panelists can chime in um, for rebuttal, but uh, we want the person who was asked a question to uh, get the answer out. So how would you retain and bring jobs back to the U.S.? So I would definitely support Trump's policies. I, he, his policies currently, I mean, I, I think if I'm correct, that's why he's in Michigan. GM's coming back to Detroit for the first time in years. USMCA was uh, something he championed. Uh, part of that was making sure that more parts of certain auto automobiles are, are made in Michigan again, like we once did. So 
definitely champion his economy because Trump's economy is all about opportunity. Uh, more people are willing to invest under his leadership. Construction is booming. People are turning work away. So uh, unemployment is at its lowest. So definitely continue to support the policy that Trump has. Thank you. Panelists, anyone want to uh, give a little input? So I'd like, to, I'd like to throw a piece in on there too, Al, if you don't mind. Please. I think a key piece here to bring an industry back to the United States is, is focused on regulation management. And what I mean by that is reducing, reducing to scale <coughs> the, the involvement on the government and as far as the parameters that are put on place in companies to operate within the United States. Yes, we need to have clean water. And yes, we need to prefer, preserve our lands. But at the same time, we also need to have we need to have an atmosphere to where our companies can operate successfully. Because at the end of the day, every time we're forcing regulations on companies, that means we're creating more bureaucratic jobs. That means we're taking more money from the taxpayers, right? And that also means that the companies have to spend more money. Which what? It means that they can't hire as many people or they can't pay their people as much as they should be paid. So at the end of the day, regulation management is a huge piece. We need to reduce that to the bare minimum so that our companies can be competitive in the United States. Thank you, Al. Uh, Christina? I'd like to chime in a little bit sure. on that. Um, women right now are receiving higher paid jobs right now. They're, being, they're receiving higher executive levels. African Americans is actually have the lowest unemployment rate. But how to bring more jobs here is exactly what some of our individuals have already said are candidates. But one of the other things I would look at too is we want to make sure that we um, encourage our businesses to come here to Michigan too. Because what were we before? We were actually called the automobile state. The automobile state. So I got excited and thrilled when Trump was actually bringing Ford back to Michigan. Because personally, I drive a Ford. I drive a Mustang and I drive a Ford F-150. Um, the, the thing of it is, is we need to make sure we encourage those companies to come back. And we gotta make sure that it's fair for them to come back. Because before, they were actually having businesses over in Mexico. And with Trump's help, we've actually made it so that the businesses are actually coming back to Michigan. And we need to keep doing that and encouraging that more so. Thank you, Christine. Paul? Well, I'm, I might chime in as well. I mean, when we, the question is asked, how do we bring jobs and retain jobs in the US? Uh, it is President Trump's leadership that is just so critical to all of this. I mean, the president always says he will put America first. And he demonstrates that in everything he does. It's, He's here today in Michigan celebrating the new USMCA, a vast improvement over NAFTA, putting America first. In relations with China, the president is putting America first. So when we ask how do we bring jobs and retain jobs in the United States, we do what the president's leading us to do, and that is putting America first. The president, when he first came into office, said that for all regulations that are proposed, we must take two regulations off the books, and that leadership is helping to drive this booming economy. And of course, the tax reform that the Republican Congress passed in the previous Congress is contributing to that as well. Record low unemployment, wages on the rise. That's all President Trump's leadership. And should you send me to Washington, I will support that agenda to keep jobs in this country. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, all candidates. Um, uh, honorable, uh, obviously, this is all going to be related because it's about the economy. Um, but if we're talking about reducing regulations, letting the go having the government get out of the way so uh, economies can thrive, um, in particular, when you get to Washington, what federal departments would you shrink, close, or possibly even grow? Uh, Alan, why don't we start with you as the first uh, as our, our uh, respondent? So first of all, I'd like to go after the IRS. 10,000 pages that you need a law degree to understand, all right? Reducing the size of the, the, IR, the, the tax policy is, is one, going to reduce a lot of funding that's needed for the IRS, right? We're talking billions of dollars, right? We've seen how much money came into the IRS for, the, for under 2019. So for one, IRS. And that goes back to my regulations management, too, so that companies are able to be more, more competitive in the United States. All right. Additionally, I'd like to see the federal income tax reduced for American citizens as well. And then how about the VA, Veterans Affairs? Personally, as a person who goes through the VA, I understand the complications and the, the array of mazes that you have to go through. Look, we already have an outstanding, an outstanding medical industry in our, in our secular world. So why not take our veterans 
and put them into that and reduce funding on permanent VA hospitals and all the staff that it takes to run those. Let's make smart decisions. Lastly, when I was in, when I was in college in 2013, when I got back from Africa, I went to the University of Michigan and I was placed into a out-of-state citizenship status, despite being a Michigan resident my entire life. So that means I had to pay a higher tuition rate, even though I had earned the post 11 GI Bill, which was a uh, government program to allow me to go to school and have the federal government pay for it because of my time in service. So I joined the SVA, Student Veterans of America. And with that, I took, took some leadership there. And together with those students, we were able to, while we were in college, light the torch, which ultimately resulted in HR 3230, which saved the taxpayers millions of dollars. So at the end of the day, it comes down to making smart decisions. Let's be smart with the money. Let's make sure that every dollar spent is spent as in, 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 in smoothly as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Paul, we'll go to you next. Same question? Same question. All right. A little very, rebuttal. Well, well uh, you know, I, I, I think uh, when we talk about what, what we need to do to right-size the government, we always have to focus on providing the services that are necessary and staying on the core constitutional responsibilities of the government. And one thing that is just fabulous about President Trump's leadership is, is that he has placed leaders in the various executive branches that are focused on making, returning the focus to what is needed by the American people. Just a couple examples of that. There are parts of the government that, in, that as we so affectionately call Washington, D.C., the swamp, the president and his executive leaders are moving those out of Washington, D.C. and taking them closer to the places where they're involved in their regulation. And that, that act alone, while it may not by itself reduce any regulation, it brings those regulators closer to the people that they are regulating, which should make those, re those regulations much more rational, much more responsive to the people that they are uh, impacting. Uh, another nice thing about the leadership that we're getting under President uh, Trump is that there are executive leaders who are looking for ways to reduce the size of the federal workforce. And the federal workforce grows and grows and grows. And so it's important, it's one of many reasons why it's important for us to reelect President Trump, that we will continue to have Republican leadership in the Department of Education, in the uh, State Department, at the Pentagon, so that there will be a close eye on those expenditures to keep them in control. And one other thing I might say about regulation, there is a bill before Congress now uh, regulations uh, from the executive in need of scrutiny, R-E-I-N-S, the RAINS Act, which typically in regulations, uh, there, all the rulemaking that goes on in the, in the executive branch is without constitute, or rather without congressional oversight. This plot, this uh, bill would make any, uh, I'm sorry, any, would make any new rules that were, had an impact of $100 million or more subject to congressional approval. So if you send me to Washington, that's the type of bill that I would also be supporting. And of course, I will keep a hard eye on any new spending that might come before Congress. Thank you. I'll just keep moving down the table here, if I may. Christina, any thoughts on uh, what federal governments you'd shrink, I think close, or even grow? Well, thank you. I'm sorry to cut you off there for that's a minute all there. That's right. We're I here think to that hear you. The, the biggest things that we've heard tonight, I, I agree with the individuals that have actually stated that. But one of the things that we also have to remember too is we have to remember that who we are electing, because if we understand this, we see the Democrats always wanting more regulations, more things that cost money, more things that cost the deficit. Why do you think that the country is owed so much money? I mean, we, we owe trillions of dollars. We have a deficit that's just, it's a vast, enormous deficit. And we need to make sure that we actually get in there and we elect people that care about our district, that care about the people that are in our district, and make sure that we are looking at what regulations that we actually are cutting and make sure that we're not doing something that is going to completely interfere with somebody else's lifestyle in the 8th district. We want to make sure that we're taking care of you. Terrific. Thank you, Christina. Nikki, you want to wrap it up on this one? Sure. Uh, it's pretty simple. Wherever the federal government doesn't belong to be constitutionally, they should be out of. So uh, one of the biggest areas I would say is even education. Those dollars should become as local as possible. They should go back to local school districts where I really believe that uh, our teachers and our administrators in those districts know what best to do with those dollars. 
Um, so I would, I would start by looking anywhere and everywhere uh, we don't belong being constitutionally. Thank you, and thank you all. Uh, interesting insight. Um, this is not quite, we're not quite to the lightning round yet, but this question I have a feeling is going to be fairly quick. Along those lines, what grade would you give our own Betsy DeVos as Education Secretary thus far? Uh, Nikki, we'll work our way back. Your She's answer. She's getting an A. An A. Christina? I give her an A. Paul? Uh, I'm sure there's something that would be objectionable, so I might say A minus. But actually, when I was giving that answer earlier about executive leadership that was reducing uh, uh, the size of a department, uh, it was her leadership there that was reducing the number of jobs in the Department of Education, so she's doing a nice job. Alan? I'd give her an A minus as well. A minus. Thank you all. Um, if we do bring jobs and increase jobs in the United States, and particularly to Michigan and the 8th District, um, we want everyone to make a decent amount of money so they can support a family, buy cars, buy homes, live the life that they're looking to live. Um, the Democrats uh, often talk about an, a uh, minimum wage, that they want to increase it. What can we do, uh, or what will any of you do, uh, when you're representing the 8th District to help people make as much money as possible? We don't care about the minimum, we want the most for them. How would we do that? Christina, would you lead off? Sure. I'd like to start off with this. If we raise the minimum wage, if we want to do it like how New York's doing it, they're, I believe it's like $18 that they have as a minimum wage, that's absolutely ridiculous because if you look at things, you, you go to McDonald's. If you see, the prices have actually gone up. I mean, once in a while I like to go to McDonald's, get a burger, probably not the best thing to do after campaigning all day, but you go get a burger, it's not the same price it was maybe two years ago. It's because of the fact that we're having more uh, minimum wage hikes. So what's happening is, is if we go with a minimum wage and we raise it, it's actually going to raise our prices. So it's going to make us suffer that problem. And that, that's a definitely no-no that we cannot do. Um, how are we going to make um, people make more money? We have to create more jobs. But right now, President Trump has done a wonderful job in creating jobs. I mean, the veterans have more jobs now. We see, I just went to a seminar that the women are actually, the veterans, excuse me, the women veterans are actually, their employment is higher now. We have women's jobs and executive levels. They're doing much better now. African Americans, it's the highest unemployment rate ever. So we just not, we need to keep going on the Trump track right now and bring, keep bringing the jobs to Michigan. And again, continue on with those manufacturing jobs like for Ford and GM and get them into our, our state. Thank you, Christina. We'll work inside and then out. Paul Young, would you give us uh, your thoughts? I think this idea about how do we help all people in the economy and how do we help people make sure they earn a living so that they can support their family really drives or gets to some of the main differences between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. Uh, if we leave it to Nancy Pelosi, if we leave it to Chuck Schumer, if we leave it to Alyssa Slotkin, we know we're going to get more regulation, we're going to get more government mandates, and for whatever perceived problem that they have, they are going to say we need some government program or some, some central control. I reject that approach. I'm with the president saying we need free market approaches. When we have a dynamic economy with rational tax systems, with regulations that make sense, it allows the, the opportunity to grow, allows the chances that Americans will take and, and get out there and do jobs. And, and, and we're seeing it, of course. We're seeing a growth in the economy. And we also know, because we, we've seen it, the, the stagnation during the Obama years versus the growth in the Trump era, we see wages growing. And wages are growing not just uh, in an equal fashion. In fact, a, a study by the Federal Reserve indicates that the, uh, uh, the wages at the lowest level are growing at the fastest rate. So it is, it is a, 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 a regulation system that allows for opportunity that is the best way to allow people to provide for their families. Thank you, Paul. Alan? So ha being a person who's had three businesses in their lifetime, to which one was very successful, getting rid of regulations is key in this, right? With that, in order to see wages increased, we need competition. The more businesses we have, the greater it is for the consumer. And in this case, the consumer is the American citizen. So if there's a multitude of companies, that means that the, the worker, the American worker, gets more companies to choose from. And this, the way economics works, is that these companies now have to compete for that individual worker. 
I mean, we're going to see a rise in skilled trades because they don't teach skilled trade jobs in school anymore, right? So what's going to happen with that piece? I mean, the way I'm looking at it here is if I'm raising a kid right now, I'd want to put them into an avenue where they're learning a skilled trade because we're going to see those, those wages get very competitive very soon here, especially in Trump's economy with all the industry coming back. Thank you, Alan. Nikki. So this question is 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 great. I uh, you know I I'll address the minimum wage just shortly. Uh, it's we know that when when we talk about minimum wage, we talk about business bottom line and and those things they're important. But what you asked also was how do we address uh, allowing people to take home more of their paychecks? So I would flip that on its head, really, the idea of minimum wage and talk more about all of the other regulation that we continue to see impacting a family's bottom line, which would be health insurance, home insurance, car insurance, student loan debt. Some of those things are, are federal, some of them are not. But the point is, we now have millennials graduating from college with an incredible amount of student loan debt and probably the highest rate of regulatory insurances for their family's budget than ever before. And so you need somebody who's got a strong voice, who's been through it, who lives it every day. And so that's, you know, personally I think that's, the question is really more focused on how are you gonna participate in those conversations as a whole. Terrific, thank you. A rising tide lifts all boats. Um, if, uh, if we're gonna have these jobs and, um, and people need to get to them, infrastructure, uh, is always going to be an issue. It seems to be uh, always on the agenda, but the roads never seem to get quite all paved. Um, the infrastructure is in need of repair. How would you address the problem? And then for a little end question, would you be for tolls on the roads to improve the tolls? Um, let's start with Alan Hoover. Okay, so when it comes to infrastructure, yes, absolutely. Infrastructure is very important and is critical to the companies and the industries within the United States. So how do we improve our infrastructure? Well, how about we make infrastructure that's going to last, all right? With that, we need our roads to be made out of material that's going to last longer than what we see. So that way, when we are working on a freeway for two years and all the citizens in the, in the industry is using side streets to make up for it, by the time those freeways are fixed, those other roads aren't deteriorated. It's about making smart decisions. It's about getting the best product and the right product for the job. And then on top of that, it's about holding companies accountable as well as politicians accountable. How many times have we seen a tax in the state of Michigan that was supposed to go towards the roads, right? We had one in the DMV, we had one that hit gas, and then now the governor's trying to do another one for gas. At the end of the day, we need to make our dollars stretch and go. The, the money that's being spent, it needs to be inspected. Right? Let's see where this money's going. Let's see what it's being put on. We need to make the dollars, the American tax dollars, because it's the individual American citizen's dollar that's paying for this stuff. We need to have the people that, is, that are overseeing these, these policies and, and these array of, of infrastructure changes, they need to make sure that our dollars are being spent accordingly. Tolls, yes or no? Yes for tolls, yes. Thank you. We're gonna just work our way across this time. Paul Young. All right, uh, infrastructure and tolls. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with an, an observation. The president ran on the idea that he wanted to work on infrastructure. And of course, what are we doing in Washington instead? We're wasting our time with impeachment. So one thing I promise if I'm sent to Washington is, is I will not be wasting the Congress's time or your time on impeachment. Instead, I will actually work on projects that we've talked about that would improve the lives of the people in the 8th District and throughout the country. I think some of the approach to working on infrastructure would be at the federal level is taking federal monies and returning them to the states so that the states can take that money and make the repairs and do the things that they know they need to do. Let's not have central bureaucrats in Washington telling Michigan or any other state, fix that road, work on that bridge or build some bridge to nowhere. Let's send those federal tax revenues back to the states so the states can make decisions about how to work on the infrastructure that they know they need to fix in their jurisdiction. Of course, with any, any spending, we need to try to be as wise and as, as uh, efficient with it as we can. Uh, and as to the question of tolls, uh, I know I don't like paying them, uh, even when they're a little easier with some electronic uh, device on your windshield. If we were going to bring them, I think in the state of Michigan, I would, I would probably defer that to the state level, not the federal level. 
I would be skeptical of tolls, I must admit, but I would be willing to look at a, a study on that issue to decide if they were needed and how to equitably use them, but I must say I'd be skeptical about them. Thank you. Christina, infrastructure, tolls. Thank you. <clears throat> First of all, I think that's very, very important to um, America. And President, did, President Trump did run on that um, issue alone with many other issues. But the thing of it is, is that before we actually start doing something like this, we also need to look at the, the budget in of itself. And when I go to Congress, I want to look at the budget and study that budget and make sure that we, are, we have our appropriate monies and in individual sections. And also, looking at this, we want to make sure that we cut the fat. We want to get rid of things like pork barrel spending. We didn't need Obama phones. We didn't need extra spending. And we get that with the Democrats, and we get that from them always you know, wanting to spend our money on frivolous things. We need to make sure that we look at that budget first, and that's what we would need to do, what I would do, and then go and look at um, how to build back America. But as the roads, I would say this. We used to, we have an OWI law here in Michigan, and it's a .08. It, it's supposed to be, it used to be a .10. And the reason why it's not a .10 is because of the fact we get federal funding. So it's at a .08. So I'd like to know where that money is going. It was, I thought it was supposed to actually go for some of the roads and things of that nature. So if we give block grants, we should have some kind of purse strings on that, some kind of um, attachments that make sure that they're actually using the money for the benefit of what we're giving it to and give it as a block grant. But we need to look at the budget first. We don't need to go in more in debt in America. And uh, for the acronym challenged OWI? OWI? Oh, excuse me, Operating While Intoxicated. Thank you. <laughs> Nikki Snyder. And tolls, did we answer tolls? Yeah, uh, oh, no, I did not. Oh, and tolls, tolls, yes or no? <laughs> Sorry, I was just a little long-winded on that okay. one. Um, the tolls, I would actually, that's a very difficult answer because I, too, I do not like spending more money than I have to. And going to Ohio, I know that you have to pay tolls. And I really hate that. Um, I don't know about you, but I, I hate doing that. So, but I do <coughs> believe that when you go to Ohio, their roads are really nice and, and they're smooth. And so maybe we need to do that here in Michigan and maybe have to like just, I, I don't know, um, take the plunge and, and actually go for that, that bunny. And it might cost us a couple dollars a day and maybe we just do it on certain roads or certain highways. But the thing of it is, is we need to do something about these roads. And, and Ohio has greater roads than we do and other states do. It's a shame that we have the roads we have. I'll take that as a maybe. I'd say maybe. <laughs> and Nikki. I'll start by saying that I just, I support Trump in this area, his know-how. Uh, he spent his entire career building and maintaining infrastructure. So I would agree with Paul. If we get out of his way with impeachment, uh, let him do what he does best, we'll definitely have a leader that will, that will guide and direct us as we move forward. Um, another thing is returning those federal dollars to local authorities for roads. Uh, definitely, 100%. Although I, I, I must say I'm concerned. I mean, we have a governor here in the state of Michigan that if we send those dollars back to her, what will she do with them? She wants to take $3.5 billion and put our kids into more debt, right? And uh, that won't even touch the local roads. So uh, I would definitely say, yeah, send, the, send those dollars back. Go, go fight for those dollars. Send them back. Uh, but be sure to have a good relationship with exactly what we're doing with those dollars, because those dollars should go to where we said they would go. Um, the other thing, uh, tolls, I'm kind of a hard no on this. I, I, I feel like this is a very clear opportunity to say, I am not going to raise your taxes to solve any problems. Thank you very much, and thank you all. Um, now, uh, some uh, two lightning round questions. Uh, before we move on to our next area of discussion. Uh, Can we get a rebuttal on that? Uh, well, if you like. I, could we do that? For sure, a you second? can take a, a, but be brief. I'll be brief. I actually would like to say this on the toll roads. I think what we need to do is listen to the 8th District, and that's all of the constituents. We need to listen to you and find out what, your, what you want, and that's what we need to do. Anybody else for a last comment on that? So I gave a short answer. Al, and my short answer was yes, Ish. right? Yeah. It, it, was, it, was a, it was a hard yes. But now there's a reason why, okay? 
like why are our freeways and our roads in Michigan so bad? Because we have other countries, corporations sending their, their industry on, our, on trucks over our roads through the ports, right? So when I'm thinking tolls, I'm not thinking the guy who, or the gal who works at Ford Motor Company who's driving the work from their local city every day, or FCA or GM, I'm thinking about the corporation that's owned by Canada or that's owned by Japan or China that's sending their, all their goods through our ports and then down our freeways. Those are the tolls that I was thinking of because I was thinking on a federal perspective. I wasn't thinking on a state pr perspective because I'm running to be a U.S. representative in the federal Congress, not the state Congress. Thank you. Anybody else for one last word on it? Thank you all. Um, now for uh, lightning round, so again, be brief on these, and then we'll move on to our, our next area of discussion. Um, this is a little lighter, so um, I'll start with Paul. Who's your favorite president? Uh, I'll go with Abraham Lincoln. And Christina? Actually, it's Abraham Lincoln. I have a, a statute of him in my office. Nikki Snyder. You get roasted if you don't say Trump, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's up to you. I would say Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. <laughs> Alan. President George Washington, the warrior president. And uh, lastly, Paul. Oh, no. I'm going to stick with Abraham yeah. Lincoln. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I didn't miss anybody, did I? No, nope, no. Nope. Okay, sorry. I'm getting out of sync. It's all amateur. Two favorites. <laughs> thank you. You get a second shot at it. Uh, thank you all for, for uh, that one. And um, secondly, what's your thoughts on the new Space Force that will work from that way down? Nikki Snyder. Space Force. Gosh, I think that requires exploration. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Christina. I think we need to have a lot more expo exploration on that. I think we need to look into that. Um, plus, again, I know I said this a couple times tonight, it's about the deficit. We got to look at our budget too. Um, we can't be spending a lot of money on things that we don't need or may maybe do need. Um, so we really need to look in that and research at it. Paul. I'll be short. Uh, you know, you wish there weren't threats from the heavens, but uh, it, it's, with the technology the way it is, we must do things to defend the American way of life wherever the threats come from. Even space. Even space. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, at, oh, I'm sorry, Alan Hoover. I <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, yeah. <laughs> so with that, Space Force, right? Before 21st century, war was a three-dimensional environment, land, sea, and air, okay? But now we see what? We see attacks happening in the FBI, we see a cyber attacks happening in the VA, and we see cyber attacks happening in the American citizens and the corporations within the United States. Space Force does not send spaceships up to fight intergalactic wars. Space Force protects your servers, it protects the, 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 the structures of, your, of the servers within the corporations, and it ensures that your data, your social security number for yourself and your kids that are being sent to the different arrays of the government is protected. That's what Space Force does. So to hear someone, or to hear anybody say that Space Force isn't a good idea, I, um, just to me, it, it's, it is a vital asset. Because at the end of the day, we don't need our social security numbers and our intelligence and all of our other data being sent over to China or Russia because they're hacking into our servers. Space Force protects that. Thank you very much, and thank you all. Um, and well, I want to thank you all for watching. Uh, we're ha we have the 8th Congressional Districts here, our Republican candidates, um, and we're going to be moving on to some domestic policy at this point. And I'll start with Christina, if I may. Um, the Democrats are pushing for Medicare for All as a big government solution to deliver medical services to citizens in the United States. Uh, since Republicans aren't the big government solution people, um, how would you suggest that we facilitate care for all? Care for all. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, Medicare for all is, is just going to be a burden on the people, it, for the forgotten people, the middle class, everyone in, in America. Because what's going to happen is it's going to fall upon us, the Medicare for all. So we cannot have this. It's a, it's a huge socialist um, issue and progressive ways of the Democrats. I, I would say this, the one thing that the Republicans and the Democrats do agree on is that we do agree that Obamacare has to go, but we don't agree on the way it has to go. I would suggest that we're a capitalist country. We need to stay that way. 
We need to make sure that we have transparency in our um, prescription drugs. We need to lower those prescription drugs. We also need to make sure that when we get insurance coverage, because you know I've seen a lot of times when we have insurance, we buy insurance for families, and lots of families for four, they'll have $1,500 that they have to spend in health care. And what happens is that they don't have that much money to spend during that year or during that month. They have 4000 that month, spend $1,500 a month for health insurance. So what do we do to have care for all? We want to make sure that we have affordable health care, but we want to make sure that we do it the right way. And we have to have transparency in our health care. But I believe the most important thing is to make sure that we reduce the cost on the prescription drugs. It's very sad to see an elderly person, and I saw this the other day, an elderly person not be able to afford their drugs, and she had to walk out of the pharmacy because she couldn't afford them. And I thought, that's the reason why I'm running for Congress. I'm going to fight for that lady. Thank you. Paul Young. I guess what I'd say about Medicare for All is, is if you enjoy rationed care, if you like long lines, if you like to have to wait for months to get the uh, r uh, operations or care you need, then you will love Medicare for All. Medicare has been a good program and it is a program I would protect when it is limited to the, the, the population that it serves. Uh, right now we have 180 million Americans who have work provided health insurance and for the most part they like their health insurance. So when the Democrats are threatening to take from you the health insurance and protections that you have, uh, I will absolutely, absolutely stand against that. Uh, as a conservative, what I want to do is incremental improvements, market-based improvements, and improvements that focus on the doctor-patient relationship because it is the care provider and the person receiving that care that are most fundamentally uh, impacted by that. And so anything to do with, with uh, health care would be, f for me, would be doctor and patient focused. Thank you, Paul. Alan Hoover. So Medicare for all. First of all, it's a 90% solution. And when I say that, I don't mean that it's fixing something. I mean that when somebody goes to the hospital and they're using Medicare, it's only going to pay for 90% of it. So the hospitals, they're forced to, to cover those services at that rate, which means then that the civilian sector who has to carry insurance for, that, for their employees are going to be receiving the pushback on that. So now they're being hit with 120 to 130% to cover the 90%. So if Medicare for all is forced on everyone within the country, then that's, the hospitals are going to go out of business. Who's going to pay for that? Where are we going to push that other 10% that's going to add up on 330 million people in our country? Additionally, Medicare for All, how about American citizens? Why are, why are we even considering insurance platforms from our government for people that aren't American citizens, right? American citizens first in America. The next piece on that, again, I'm a veteran. When I, when I was in Jordan in 2019 doing my deployment over there, I was injured, okay? I had to wait eight months to get my surgery because I went through the VA. If you have to wait eight months to get your surgery, what's that look like? Has anybody ever been to a, a Canadian hospital? Has anybody here ever been to a Veterans Affairs hospital? Do they know what it's like to have to wait three months to see a doctor because you had a cold two months ago? It's, it's, it's not effective. At the end of the day, we need to reduce regulations so that companies can be competitive, so that insurance companies can be competitive. This is a capitalistic country. This is a republic. It's not socialism. At the end of the day, capitalism works best for Americans. And Nikki Snyder. As a future congresswoman and someone who has been a nurse and in healthcare for 18 years, this is my wheelhouse. So should I go to DC? This is going to be a conversation I'll continue to be a part of significantly. I will oppose Medicare for all. Uh, the biggest thing with Medicare for all, what we've seen with the Universal Healthcare Act, is a significant increase in deductibles, premiums, and co-pays for families and their bottom line. That's if we already have something that's not working, to add to that is not something that we're going to be able to manage. Uh, one of the things Trump has done during his presidency is to focus in and zero in on transparency. If we have transparency in cost, we have patients that can make decisions that are best for them with their dollars. And that's, that's local control at its finest in healthcare. The other thing that we haven't talked about yet is what happens in universal healthcare countries where um, ethics is concerned, if you will. All of a sudden you have a single payer system, you have one product, and you have one authority, if you will, or one voice that decides what's best for you and what choices that you should make. 
at integral periods of your life that are important. Cancer, uh, death, uh, these things are important. I, I don't want ethics boards to make decisions for you. I want you to make decisions for you. Uh, other candidates, would you like to have a little rebuttal or feedback there? All good. Sure. Thank you all. And thank you again for watching. Um, next on to uh, another topic that uh, seems to be pressing uh, but never quite solved, the war on poverty. Um, we've been fighting it for decades and it seems like poverty still wins in many places. Um, what would you suggest uh, that would be free market principles that could make meaningful, meaningful reductions in the poverty rate. And I'll start with Christina. Well, you started with me the last time. Well, we'll still start <laughs> with you. <laughs> you know, that's a good question. Um, I think that, can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Sure. The war on Those poverty has been one. fought for decades, and it seems like poverty is winning many of the battles in many places. What free market principles would you propose to make meaningful reductions in poverty? I think that, that what you need to really realize too is for poverty, when we go and look at poverty, we, may, we need to make sure why are we having this problem in America? That's the first thing we need to do. And before we can come up with a solution, and this is what I do in my practice all the time, we actually have to look at why, what is the reason, why did this happen, what can we do after that? So it's a cause and effect. So the first thing that you need to do is we need to find out why we're having the issues of poverty. Um, some of the reasons, you know, I've, I've seen because of the fact is, is that many of the fathers are in prison and um, the, the mom is uh, actually taking care of the child on a full-time basis and the son or the, or the child or the daughter is actually going out there trying to go um, and maybe getting into drugs or things of that nature. So then they have to pay legal fees out or something of that nature. So we look at why are we having the cause of poverty? What can we stop? And I think one of the things that Trump did this year in the last two years, I believe it was a year and a half, was the criminal reform. Um, we've had a lot of individuals be, um, it was racially motivated, the um, crime itself. And we had a lot of individuals in prison, and I'm very proud of our president for having the criminal reform. But again, I know that I'm going a little off topic here, but I wanted to make sure that we look at what is the cause of poverty. And when you get the cause of poverty, then you can come up with a solution. And I will probably have, I will have more solutions after I go and look at the really causes of it, because it's a cause and effect issue. Alan, or, well, no, anyone chime in. Paul, you were going to jump in? I, I, Alan, <coughs> do you want to go, or she, what, what do you want to do here? Let Alan go. Alan, why don't you go? <laughs> okay, look, I grew up in poverty, okay? I was born to a poor family, all right? I, and I lived in southwest Detroit for a while. I tell you what, at the end of the day, you show me a 30, 40, 50-year-old ghetto, and I show you a city that's been predominantly ruled by Democrats during that whole duration. Now, with that, how do you, how do you, how do you defeat poverty? You got to tackle it as an individual. How did I defeat poverty? I started working when I was 12, 13, 14 years old, right? With that, it takes hard work. We also have to restore family values, but it doesn't mean the government goes into your home and, and restores family values. No, instead, it's, it's creating, creating talks, right? How do we restore family values? How do we bring families back together so that we don't have single parents raising kids? Well, a big piece in that is responsibility. You have to teach the young about responsibility these days. How do you do that? Community leaders, churches perhaps? At the end of the day though, in order to tackle poverty, the war on poverty, you need to focus on responsibility, hard work, determination, and making the right decisions. It wasn't, it wasn't one decision overnight that got me out of the ghettos that removed me from poverty. It was a multitude of decisions. And it was with me building and retaining and restoring relationships with people that, I, that wanted to be mentors that I could learn from. At the end of the day, you got to get up, you got to put your boots on, and you got to go to work if you want to get out of poverty. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Nikki, we'll mix it up. Sorry, Paul. Sorry, right. right. <laughs> A I'm number of that. things come to mind, but <laughs> right. I'll first say that poverty is devastating. It's real, it, it needs to be acknowledged uh, continuously. 
Literacy is one of the biggest, most important things for poverty. Uh, research shows very clearly that if we struggle with literacy, we're going to struggle with poverty. And so that is something that I have done as a member of State Board of Education has been very a, a champion of literacy. Opportunity for all is another thing that, that we should really, really be championing. Uh, just making sure that's at the core of, of who we are. That's who we are as Americans. Uh, encourage deregulation of small businesses. Uh, the, more, the more able small businesses are able to set up and thrive, the more jobs that there will be available. Relationship, we need to care. We need to care for one another. Uh, we're neighbors always at the end of the day. Um, and then just be clear that there are programs out there for, for those who are unemployed, return to work programs. Think there are services that are valuable for those who need them. Thank you. Paul. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to focus on the phrase you used, which is war on poverty. That was a phrase that was used by uh, Lyndon Johnson when he was president. And almost every study of all the programs that were instituted by President Johnson were a failure. They, the war on poverty just created more poverty. It's the conceit of central planning. It's the idea if you see a problem, what we need to do is create a federal bureaucracy. We need to spend send federal tax money there, and, and that with that federal tax money, we will somehow address that problem. It's the conceit of central planning. Free market reform, reducing regulations, rationalizing tax rates, that's how it gets done. And we've seen it during the Trump administration. We've talked about one example where wages, especially at the lowest level, are rising. Unemployment. Unemployment is at record lows across all kinds of uh, parts of the society, that's a real uh, way to create and give people the opportunity to get out of poverty. And just one other example, the use of food stamps is at a record low. Another indication that under the types of policies that President Trump is implementing, we don't call it a war on poverty, but it creates opportunity and lets people get out of poverty through a free market. I think we pretty well covered that one. Thank you. Um, Next, we'll move on to something that actually could cause poverty, and that's the cost of college right now. Um, the cost of college continues to go up for students and families. Um, how would you propose reducing those costs? And we'll start with Nikki Snyder. Uh, so part of this is, a, is a part of an equation that we can't solve, if you will. So we're not, as a federal um, office holder, we wouldn't be in charge of universities. Uh, they need to cut costs the best they can. and make college affordable for students. This is a significant part of the equation that we can't control, but we can have the conversation. There's also federal grants and student loans uh, for higher ed that, that our government sends back to states. And I think we now need to start considering what does it look like to be accountable to those dollars uh, so that they actually go farther and they're efficient. Thank you. Paul Young. Uh Actually, cost of college, I think, is another example of the problems when the federal government just gets too involved. The cost of college has exploded over the last 20 to 30 years, far in excess of the rate of inflation. And one of the central drivers of that increase in cost is, is federal loans that, that tell college administrators, hey, guess what? Whatever you do, th these monies will be paid through federal taxpayer funds. And of course, unfortunately, it also creates a terrible burden on young people who think and get told, all you have to do is get a college degree and that leads to the golden, golden land. And of course, studies have indicated on average a college degree does help increase your lifetime earnings. But it really has been a problem of federal policy that has created the, the just in, out of control increase in costs. So what we should do is rationalize so, so much of the, the, the federal involvement in guaranteeing student loans that just tells college administrators, hey, you'll get your money and you can leave students holding the bag. That's a problem and we need to find solutions. Alan Hoover. At the end of the day, I'm all about reducing the size of the government, okay? Now with that, Congress, what? Has the right to coin and purse our money. So why is it that the banks are protected when it comes to tuition loans? You take three kids, three different kids from any city in the United States, they got the same credit score, they're the same age, and they just graduated. If each one of those kids go and they apply for a home, a home mortgage, they're going to get denied. Why? Because they don't have a job. If they go and they apply for a business loan, they're going to get denied. Why? Because they don't have anything to back it up with. But at the end of the day, they can go and get a, a PhD in basket weaving for $120,000 from any university that they want, and they're going to get approved. Why? Because the banks don't have risk. You need to remove the risk piece that the banks are protected by, so that way it's an even playing field. If we want our kids to have a future and not have 
trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars of debt, then we need to remove this barrier that protects the banks. At the end of the day, if a person is not successful with their PhD in underwater basket weaving, they can't file for bankruptcy like they could if they had a, they went out and they dared to take a business and try and make something out of it and it failed. End of the day, remove the risk so that it's a shared risk. We need to remove the protection from the banks. It needs to be a shared risk between our kids, our college students that are the future of our country. Christina Light. Thank you. Um, the cost of college has gone up. I had to pay for law school myself. During the years of when I was attending Eastern Michigan University, I had to pay, I had to work probably about four to five jobs, work those jobs, and then study when I came home from work at about two o'clock to three o'clock in the morning. And I remember asking my mom to type those papers up. And I'm like, no, you're not doing those right. So anyway, I would ask her to do that. But I remember it was tough. And I was trying to pay for that schooling myself. And I didn't know that I had to save all this money up. So what it does, what you have to do is it starts at home. Our, our education has to start at home. And that means with morals, it also means with, we gotta make sure that we start our, telling our kids that we need to start saving. But we also need to find a solution too about how to lower the cost of college and maybe um, putting some tax deferments on of um, their, their money when they're saving their money. Um, also, we need to look at too, like the skilled trades. The skilled trades, maybe if we push more people, because not everybody has to go to college. Everybody thinks that they have to go to college. You know what, what I love about America is you can do anything you want to do and be anyone you want to be. But we have to have that foundation with the parents and we also have to get parents involved again. And so what I'm trying to say here is this, is I believe in laissez-faire with government. That means hands off on government. We need to cut back on the regulations and cut back on things so that we don't have trillions and trillions of dollars of deficit. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna to move to the next question because it's basically uh, a bit of a color commentary on what we just talked about. Um, and in this case, we're gonna start with Alan Hoover. How would you describe American exceptionalism? Huh. American exceptionalism. 245 years, that's American exceptionalism. We're a superpower, right? Our, our culture, our customs, our courtesies, our industry, that we are the, f the forefront on technology. We, we are exceptional in everything that we do as Americans that we put our minds to and we put efforts to. If it wasn't for the United States of America, the rest of the world would probably be speaking German from World War II. That's American exceptionalism. American exceptionalism is such a universal perspective when it comes to the United States of America. I mean, how can you not just look at the United States from afar and see the exceptionalism? I am proud to be an American citizen. I am very fortunate to have been born in the greatest planet or the greatest country on the planet, despite being born in the poverty. But at the end of the day, you got to put the hard work in. If you want to see something and you want something, you got to work for it. Alan, thank you. Nikki Snyder, you're next. American exceptionalism. American exceptionalism. I mean, it's pretty exceptional when you think about the founding fathers that left a king that was oppressive to them, burned the ships and didn't look back. I mean, that's pretty exceptional. We strive, we don't stop, we get back up, we keep moving forward. Thank you. Christina Light. You know, I could go on and on and on about this tonight, but I know I that I have limited time, limited time. <laughs> and I get reminded of that all the time. But America, I love America, and we have the greatest country in the world. I visited Italy, and I um, stayed there for a few weeks. I also stayed in France for a few weeks, too, as well, and I studied international law there. And I tell you what, when I came back to America, I was basically kissing the ground that I was walking on, because we do not realize what we have in our country. We didn't have like in Italy and over in France, it was amazing that the apartment that I had was actually called a luxury apartment because they had a dishwasher. Wow, you know? We don't realize when we come back, and I remember singing the Star Spangled Banner when I got sick over in Italy because I drank too much cappuccino. Um, the point that I'm trying to make is, America is just, we have so much to offer. We have great lands, we have the lakes, we have, our natural resources, and look at what we've come about. What, look what we do. We actually come to people's rescues, rescue, 
we, we do exceptional things. And I would like to make this last point because I know that we're, I'm, I'm always long-winded. Um, but 9-11, let's look at 9-11. Do you remember when we all came back together? We came together as Americans because of the fact that somebody came after our country and we came together, Democrats, Republicans, Independents. It was the most wonderful thing to see, not the most wonderful time in the world. It was a very sad, terrible, tragic time and scary. But we all came together. Why? Because we're Americans. And we all need to do this again, come together again, because we have so much um, just diversiveness going on and people are fighting back and forth. The Democrats are, look at this impeachment process we have going on. We need to look back and see why we're Americans. We all bleed red. We're all Americans and we need to make sure that we get back to that. Paul Thank Young. You. Uh, I would root it in uh, our two founding documents. You know, the United States Constitution from 1789 and the Declaration of Independence from 1776. Those two documents get to the heart of the freedom and the opportunity that this government has established to, to guarantee and protect for the people of the United States. The, the legal rights that we have enshrined in our Bill of Rights. And so it, it has become a beacon to the world as this is the place. If you want to live your best life, America is the place that gives you the greatest opportunity. And I think it's those two founding documents that help to establish that and allow the people of America to thrive and do the things that they can and want to do. And it's that freedom that comes from those two those two founding documents that I think are at the root of our American exceptionalism. Thank you, and thank you all, and thank you all for watching. Um, this is a related question, um, and it goes into the heart of freedom. Um, how do Republicans attract voters with freedom and not free stuff? And we'll start with uh, Nikki Snyder. Uh, pretty simple, don't raise taxes. I like it. So. You can, you can go a little longer if you like. That's it. We'll, we'll take Don't it. raise taxes. Uh, we'll move, uh, then we'll go this way. Christina Like. Thank you. I think how we attract freedom is basically hand out some constitutions. Look at the liberties that we have and the freedoms that we enjoy in America. My goodness, we have the Second Amendment. We have the First Amendment. We have the right to freedom of association, the right to free press. Other countries don't have these things, these rights and these freedoms and liberties. And we need to really um, stockpile that, especially in this election, because all we hear is, you know, let's get rid of the guns, let's take your guns, red flag state laws. Little by little, they're trying to take our rights away and trying to take our constitutional, God-given rights away, our freedoms, our liberties. So we need to get out there and tell your neighbors and tell the friends that Republicans are not that way. We believe in the Constitution. It's sad that we have to actually fight for the Constitution this time around because of the fact is, is the Democrats keep pushing the progressive ways and trying to take our freedoms away, our freedom of speech. And we see it on the campuses, at the college campuses as well. Conservative uh, students can't come into the campuses and actually have you know, um, people lecture that are conservative. What's wrong with that? But, but we can bring the liberals in. What is wrong with that picture? You cannot do that. So. We need to show to the people, and I think the other thing that we need to do is this, we need to show kindness and, and get people, like woo them in and show again all the freedom and liberties that we do have and not just give things away. We can't give Obama phones away and give little um, trinkets away. It, it's, it's amazing to me that how the Democrats always push and try to give things away. And what it does is actually it pushes people into deeper debt and they also go into, um, they never rise up. They never go to the next step. They never get a job. So they just keep in the same spot. Next, Thank Paul you. Young. You know, Al, I, I appreciate the way you, you posed that. You talked about free stuff. And of course, there is no such thing as free stuff. Somebody is going to pay for it. Reminds me of a joke I heard recently that uh, a Bernie Sanders campaign person called someone and said, are you going to be supporting Bernie Sanders? And the person on the other end of the line said, no, I won't be supporting Bernie Sanders. And the caller said, well, then can I ask you who, who you will be supporting? And the person on the other end of the line said, I'll probably be supporting you and your family if Bernie Sanders wins. I mean, that's an indication of there is no such thing as free stuff. Someone is going to pay for it. So when candidates are saying, we'll pay you for this, we'll pay you for that, what they're really saying is, hey, taxpayers, get ready, because we're coming for more of your money. 
It's freedom that creates good opportunity and it makes this a country we want to live in, not some politician trying to buy votes with promises of free stuff that in reality is really stuff that they're going to stick the bill with probably most of us in this audience. Thank you. And Alan Hoover. At the end of the day, the Republican Party offers something completely different than the Democratic Party. Number one, securing and protecting our borders. That's what keeps our country, our country, is having secure borders. Number two, reducing the size of the government and their foothold in your home, keeping the government out of your home. That right there is giving you your liberties and securing your freedoms. Number three, the dominance of our military, ensuring that we have a strong military that keeps our country safe. The Second Amendment, we're going to defend your Second Amendment. You get to keep your guns. It shall not be infringed. The next piece, freedom of speech. Speak your mind on your campus without getting expelled out of school. We, the list goes on and on. We don't need to come up with new things. All we need to do is take what's in the Constitution and present that to the American people and say, hey, that's what the Republican Party does. And you can look at our track record because that's what we do. Thank you, Alan, and thank you, candidates, for uh, joining us tonight. I'm Al Hassinger, Activities VP for Greater Oakland Republicans. Uh, please join us at Go Got Meetings monthly at Canterbury Village on the second Tuesday of each month. At this point, we'll have two questions in a lightning round before we go to foreign policy. And um, I will start with Paul Young. Um, and I'll say, uh, should marijuana be legalized at the federal level? Uh, I, I think my short answer is no. Okay. That's why it's a lightning round. Alan Hoover. Hmm. This is a hard question. Look at the boxer wars in China. You're able to rule millions of people with only 100,000 people because they were addicted to drugs. At the same time, though, we see that medical marijuana does a lot of great things in the medical industry, too. So I'm going to say, yes, marijuana should be legal. I will leave it up to the individual American citizen to choose whether or not they want to use it. Christina Like. This is a very difficult um, question. Uh, one, because I'm a criminal defense attorney. <laughs> but the second thing is, is that we legalized it here in the state of Michigan. What people don't realize is that it's still federally illegal. Um, but what we're having is we're having problems with people actually smoking marijuana and getting behind the wheel and then killing somebody or injuring somebody, one of our loved ones. So I believe that um, this is a very difficult situation that we have. And I would probably have to say no on, on the marijuana um, because of the fact is, is that I, I think that people, well, we already have it in the state of Michigan that it's legalized, but I'm a conservative Republican and there's issues that we have with marijuana, and sometimes I believe that you can, uh, I, I'm just gonna leave it like that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Nikki Snyder. A lot of nuance to this issue. Uh, nowhere in the Constitution, though, does it say that should the federal government be regulating weed consumption, but nevertheless, we are here, and so one of the things that I bring to the table, which is perhaps maybe unique, is I'm noticing that um, because weed is on a Schedule One, it's hard for us to research it. We can't. So what happens is when a state legalizes it and then moms, uh, particularly moms that are pregnant, are smoking it or there's just this concept of we don't have a lot of research or knowledge around the topic, but we know that it's legal. Hey, right, that's the discussion. Um, we don't have enough information to make healthy decisions. So that, that is something that I, I will bring to the table. Thank you, and I have to emphasize the lightning part of the lightning round, my fault. Uh, um, uh, Alan Hoover, what, would, what will be your first conversation with President Trump when you go to Washington? Lightning. What was it like growing up in a wealthy household? <laughs> Paul Young. Uh, I think I'll just say, President Trump, thank you, and how can I help? Christina Like. I would actually say to him, it's an honor to meet you, President Trump. Thank you for everything that you've done um, for our country in the last three years. How can I be of assistance? What can we do? What can I do to help you to improve America and keep America great? And Nikki Snyder. 
I would say congratulations for not getting charged for a crime that you did not commit. Let's get to work. And thank you all. And thank you all for watching. This is On the Right Side with GOGOP. I'm Al Hassinger, Activities VP for the Greater Oakland Republican Club. At this point, we're going to switch gears a little bit and go into foreign policy. Um, and if I may, I will start with Paul Young. Just in general, what should our foreign policy objective be? Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to agree with uh, President Trump and say that uh, central to all considerations in foreign policy is to put America first. We do not need to be off uh, solving the world's problems. We don't need to be out trying to build nations and change countries that are fundamentally different to make them more like America. Uh, there are interests that we will need to defend. I mean, uh, we need to, when, when threats arise, as they did, for example, in World War II, it is entirely appropriate for America to defend fr th those freedoms in that way. Uh, but I would say being, being careful with our, with our armed forces. I mean, I, I respect Alan's service, and he put himself in harm's way many times. And any time a Congress or a president is going to ask people in uniform to put their lives on the line, it better be for a vital American interest. So I think I appreciate President Trump's uh, uh, approach that it is to put America first, to be limited in what we do, but when we do address a threat, to take it and, uh, and address it decisively. Thank you, Paul. Christina Like. I agree with how President Trump ha actually has been um, handling the foreign affairs policy. Um, I like how he makes a deal and he actually makes these promises and carries them out. And what I would like to do is help him carry those promises out because we don't have these congressman right now that are actually helping him carry out things. He's had to do a lot of things on his own executive orders and we don't have the the Congress that we should have in there that's actually helping him to put America first. So with the foreign policy we need to we need to make sure that we protect our veterans. Um, my uncle uh, received a, um, a Purple Heart and I'm very honored to have him as my uncle. Um, I have a picture of him in my office and, you know, it speaks volumes and I'm very, and I, I, that's the reason why I do pro bono cases for the veterans in my, in my office because without them I wouldn't have my freedom or the liberties that I enjoy every single day. So we need to make sure that we're careful with our military, where we put them, and make the decisions that are in the best interest of America. Thank you, Christina. Nikki Snyder. Foreign policy, whether we're talking about interventionalism, isolationism, Trump is doing it right. And one thing you will not see me do as your congresswoman is write a war powers resolution trying to take his power away from him as if he isn't doing it right. Uh, so, you know, at the, at the end of the day, you don't search out war, uh, but you do have the intelligence to recognize when it's imminent and you need to have the spirit and courage to fight it. Terrific. And Alan Hoover. Look, at the end of the day, as a Foreign Security Force Advisor, I operated in 19 different countries around this globe, okay? I worked on the behalf of the United States as an ambassador, all right? Now, with that, we have our allies. But why is it that the American citizen has to pay for our military to go over there and defend these other countries? And then these countries aren't giving us anything for it. And then we still have to send millions of dollars to these other countries as well. Why are we being the welfare state? At the end of the day, if countries are gonna rely on the United States of America, then it needs, they, need to, they need to fork up the buck for it. What is, what is the American citizen's blood worth? What is the blood of a, of a United States Marine sailor, airman, or soldier worth? Why is it that we send our people over there and we don't get anything back in return? Look, take, for example, the war in Iraq. $90 billion waved off. After, after we won that war. Does that, that doesn't make any sense to me. Look, yes, I support the president. I'm all about America keeping its dominancy and being a, a world power. At the same time, the other 194 countries, if they want to be globalist, a globalist world government or whatever perspective that is, have at it. But at the end of the day, the United States is going to be an independent country, and we need to put America first, not only in America, but also on the planet. Thank you, Alan. And you sort of, I think you were looking over my shoulder because the next question is, how would you better utilize foreign policy dollars? Um, and let's start with Nikki Snyder. Uh, 
All dollars should be as local as is possible. So I'm not I'm not considering the concept of dollars needing to go to any other entity other than America First. So that sounds good. Uh, we'll work this way, Christina. Like, how could we better utilize foreign policy dollars? I think the first thing, though, that we need to do, and I, I've brought this up many times tonight, is we need to look at our. Um, we have to. We have to actually research that issue, and and also look at how much money are we receiving from different countries, um, and and basically figure out what what are we going to. How are we going to use these and make sure that we're using them appropriately and intelligently and make sure that we're using it genuinely and that we're placing it for the benefit of what our policies have been the last three years of putting America first again and, and, and making sure that America is great and America is great continuing on. Because here's what's the problem is that we have little kids out there and we have little um, family members not little family members, little brothers and sisters. And what happens is, is we have to look for their future because they're, they're ones that we have to look for. Um, we have to make sure that whatever money that we receive or foreign policy money, we've got to put it for the benefit of our future. And making sure, and this goes through all, all the deficit and the debt as well and our budget, we have to make sure that we're doing whatever is in the best interest of the future generations because they're gonna have to pay for this. Just like we're paying right now, they're gonna actually have to pay even more at a later time period. And there won't be any social security, there won't be any entitlements, there won't be any benefits, there, it's, it's gonna be dried up. And, and what we need to do is continue to make America the best country in the world. So we need to make sure that we are safe and also we, talk about how we're going to use the money appropriately. Thank you. Paul Young, how would yeah. you better utilize foreign policy dollars? Like, like with anything, I think you need to make sure you're spending the money that you do spend as wisely as you can spend it. You need to fight waste, fraud, and abuse. And I think that uh, you know this brings to light something that, that President Trump and his lawyers in the well of the Senate have been pointing out. When we have corruption in foreign countries as they are spending American dollars, why, by all means, we should investigate it and stop that corruption, stop that wasting of American taxpayer dollars. I would point out in another general way, though, that the, that the percent of the U.S., our federal budget that goes to foreign aid is relatively small, and that there are instances, certainly, where we want to spend some money to support the good guys in whatever potential conflict or trouble area there is so that we don't, don't see the problem explode and then be pushed with the problem of, is there now some basic American threat that we need to send people there? So it is often smarter to be spending some money to support the good guys, if you will. Uh, and then I would also point out that with much of our federal aid that goes to help with military spending, by regulation, almost all of that comes back and purchases things here in the United States. So it helps drive the good economy. So like with anything, let's be wise about it. Let's only use it where it really makes sense. But remember that sometimes it's, it's helping to minimize or solve a problem before it becomes a bigger problem. And back to Alan Hoover. Look, again, at the end of the day, the American dollar, the American taxpayer dollar, needs to be focused on America. I do not want to see billions of dollars going to other countries that are then being circulated back into the pockets of senators and other people that we see in, in, in the political atmosphere, as we see on the news lately, right? That needs to stop. We need to stop paying for other countries' wars. If another country needs our assistance, they need to fork up and they need to put something on the table. How cheap is American blood? It's not. It's very valuable. We are a superpower. Why are we sending our people to go die for another country and defending that country when they're not standing up for themselves? At the end of the day, you want American help? You need to put something in it. You need to get some skin in the game, all right? Additionally, look at the world the way it is right now. We see China, Iran, and Russia conducting drills together. They're training together. They're forming alliances together. I don't even think Iran would be in the picture with those three countries if we went and sent $150 billion over there in the previous administration. The insanity needs to stop. Americans first in America and America first in the world. Thank you, Alan. Um, 
And who, this is, uh, this question I'll address to Christina to start. Who is a greater threat to the U.S., Russia, China, or C, somebody else? Well, actually, to be quite, I would actually say that both Russia and China are threats to the United States. And there's various reasons for that. I mean, Russia, we had a Cold War years and years ago. But if you can see what's happening uh, now, they keep interfering. Um, they, you know, they interfered with a lot of different things. But I, I know I can be brief here. But um, in China, they interfere with our, our security, our cybersecurity. Um, they interfere with a lot of different issues. Um, and I remember watching this legal, um, Boston Legal Show, and it was like the last episode. And the last episode was when they were buying, um, China was buying the Boston Legal, the firm. And Denny Crane was on there, and he did not want that um, bought because he kept saying China o is, uh, basically owns America. And that's what was happening during the Obama years, and we were seeing it time and time again. And I have been seeing a change, and just recently um, we're making a deal, a trade deal with, with China. I thought that was the greatest news on earth. I was jumping up and down because it's about time that we stop the things that um, have been going on during the Obama years. It's like we didn't care. We weren't putting our American goals first. We weren't putting American people first. We weren't putting the 8th District first. So my, we really need to make sure that um, when we look at uh, China and Russia, these are two countries that they don't care about us. They only care about themselves. And we have to make sure that we take care of our families and make sure our families are protected and make sure our citizens are protected and make sure that China doesn't interfere with um, our military interference with like their radios, their security, or interfering with our internet or interfering with anything and making sure Russia doesn't interfere as well. But they're both threats and we gotta make sure that we watch out and be on guard and be on the defense mechanism. Thank you, Christina. Uh, we'll next go to Nikki Snyder. I wouldn't make a choice there, because the minute you make a choice, you kind of take your eye off of one and try to focus on the other, but uh, you, you keep your eye on all of them. Trump's in the right place uh, for this exact conversation. Uh, the relationship he has with uh, trade talks with China is very good. So I, I really feel, I feel good about who is leading our country in these areas? And I can honestly lay my head down at night. Thank you. Alan Hoover. So both these countries are a threat, but it depends what, what perspective you're looking at it for or uh, for the exact dynamic. With that, we see China, what are they doing? They're putting sub pins all around the world, right? They're also buying out seaports so that they can control the commerce on a shipping perspective. What was it that made England dominate before the United States of America came into existence? It was the British Navy. And then what was it that made the United States go into dominance after we, we defeated England in the Revolutionary War? It was the American Navy that came to be as well. With that, we're seeing China build a Navy, and they're trying to surpass our Navy. All right? So for when it comes from naval amphibious operations, China is definitely a threat. Into the next piece here is our servers and our PII, our personal, identifi our, our personal identifiable information. All right, social security numbers, bank accounts, all that stuff. China is hitting us, they've been caught hitting us under the previous administration multiple times. All right, and then again, with Russia, all right? Russia back when it was the USSR, it was the largest, it was the largest country on the planet. Now, they're trying, to, they're trying to restore that. Why? Because they want to go back to their global dominance. At the end of the day, we need to keep our eyes on the countries that do not have America's best interests at heart. And I would say the top three on that is China, Russia, and Iran. Thank you. Paul Young. You know, whatever the threat, it, it just reminds me that it's so good that we have President Trump responding to those threats instead of President Obama. Uh, w let's take a look at Russia. What did President Obama do? Well, when the Russians took Crimea and threatened Ukraine, he sent MREs and blankets. President Trump has sent lethal aid to allow the Ukrainians to try to defend their own country from Russian aggression. When Syria is imploding as a country, what does Barack Obama do? He draws a red line that he then runs away from and invites Russia to come into Syria. 
terrible foreign policy. Whatever threat Russia poses, helping them get more aggressive is the wrong thing to do. President Trump's leadership is helping us there too. What else happened with all what was going on with Syria? We see ISIS grow. Do you remember in 2016 that there was an actual caliphate? What happened when President Trump was elected? That caliphate was eliminated. Uh, so the, the, whatever the threat, it's good to have American leadership that puts America first. And, and just one other point is in the, the threats that come from Iran, what did President Obama want to do? He released funds so that there's hundreds of millions of dollars that then they can use to fund their terrorist organizations in Yemen or in Hezbollah or, or throughout the Middle East. Uh, and, you know, again, just creating more problems instead of focused on, on what's best for America. But to answer the question, I think long term it is China that is a greater threat. They are the second biggest economy in the world. And uh, they have shown their intent. I mean, they, they threaten Taiwan. They threaten other uh, parts of the world. Uh, and so that, it, it is, again, President Trump's leadership that challenges China, who has clearly indicated that they will steal our intellectual property. We, you see in the news routinely now that different, at, at various universities, people that are smuggling information back to China. So standing up to that threat, putting America first, whether it's against Russia, whether it's against China, whether it's against Iran, uh, whatever the threat, thank goodness we have President Trump there and that it emphasizes why we need President Trump's leadership. And if I might just make one last point about uh, what's happening here in the 8th District, Alyssa Slotkin likes to brag that she was a CIA analyst and that she was in, in there making decisions. To the extent that her advice was about let's release money to Iran and let's not take out a terrorist like Soleimani, uh, thank goodness she's not advising inside that government and let's make sure that she's a one-term Congress member so that she will not be in any position to kneecap this president or to have any influence on American foreign policy. Thank you, Paul Young, and thank you, candidates. And thank you all for watching. You're watching On the Right Side with GOGOP. I'm Al Hassinger, Activities VP for Greater Oakland Republicans. Um, this is a uh, foreign policy question, but it basically is a foreign policy question that is at our border. Um, what do you see as the best way to reform our immigration laws? And I'll start with you, Nikki Snyder. Biggest thing is not grant amnesty continue to reinforce uh, border security. Trump is building the wall. He said he would do it. He's going to continue to do it. When I think about border security and the, the keys there, basic things that impact our bottom line every day are important. Uh, when Christina said Social Security won't be there, I think what is the biggest threat for Social Security or the system that we've set up here in America is uh, illegal aliens, I'm sorry, illegal immigrants uh, gaining amnesty without acknowledging that we don't have we don't have the budget for that. It's just, it's not built in. We're, we don't have a budget to take care of, of America and Mexico. We have a budget to take care of America, and that's the key. Thank you. Alan Hoover. All right, look, when it comes to people coming into our country illegally, we need to combat it. All right, we, yes, we, we're working on a wall. We're putting a wall up. We have our borders, we secure our borders. With that, though, we have Homeland Security. We have Border Patrol, all right? And when a Border Patrol agent's out there and he finds someone who, got in, who obtained access into our country illegally, they collect them, okay? With that, if they need medical attention, they give them medical attention. And then they feed them, they clothe them, they give them a shower. Now, what I want to see happen is they send them back to their country, but they send them back to their country with a bill. Why is it that the United States American taxpayer has to pay for all that? Okay, we're talking, we're talking hundreds of dollars for the, the Border Patrol agents that had to apprehend these people. We're talking potentially thousands of dollars for the medical treatment because they were dehydrated or they broke a limb while they were maneuvering through the landscape. And then we're also talking money for feeding them and clothing them, and then also the transportation piece. It needs to stop. We need to stop putting that money on the American citizen send them back to their country, send them back with a bill, and make sure that their country pays that bill. Paul Young. Uh, I'll offer three parts to that answer. My first is that we absolutely should build the wall. I mean, every study has shown when you build a wall, the, the amount of illegal aliens crossing the border where you've built the wall goes down. So I, I absolutely support the president in that. Uh, the other is, is the asylum reform that the president has successfully implemented. I think most people watching at home and certainly here in this studio audience are familiar with the reforms that have made a difference. The way asylum worked, people could come to the border and if they were, if they were stopped, if they weren't able to just sneak across, 
what, what U.S. immigration officials did was they would release them into the United States and give them a court date to come back for their asylum hearing. And large percentages of people didn't come back for those court dates. What the change that has been made is, is when they are stopped at the border, they are now waiting in Mexico with the cooperation of the Mexican government to decide whether or not when they will have their asylum hearing. And what has occurred because of that? It's obvious that it was the green light of, hey, look, we're just going to let you, we're just going to let you be released into the United States and you can show up at your court hearing or not. Now that they're actually going to have to wait in Mexico, the number of people coming to our borders to seek asylum, cases that, uh, I, I'm forgetting the percentage, but it was like well over 70, might have been 80%, were ultimately denied, but that was because people weren't coming for their hearings in the first place. So that has greatly reduced the number of people that come. And, and I would say, too, it's not just so we can see that the asylum numbers ultimately aren't granted, but when you create that environment of a green light, it's bad. it creates uh, the, the coyotes and the smuggling, and it, it creates a volume that also allows you know, people with bad intent and with drugs. So that reform has greatly reduced the pressure at the border and has greatly reduced the opportunity for, for criminal activity that would come with otherwise good people just seeking to, to, to come into this country. And then the third part of, of my reforms to immigration would again be part of what President Trump proposed uh, just about 18, 24 months ago, and that is let's have America set up an immigration policy for Americans. Right now we have chain migration that s says typically that the most recent immigrants get to bring uh, family members and others. Let's have a system kind of like Canada or kind of like Australia where we choose who should come to America. Thank you, Paul. Christina Like. Thank you. America is the beacon of hope. I mean, at the end of the day, we are all immigrants that came to this country, but we came here legally. The problem is, is that our immigration system is broken. What are we going to do to fix it? There are very, many, many complications to this. But there's a problem that we have, and people don't realize this, but we have sanctuary cities. And the federal government says one thing, and then we have states that are doing other things. They're having these sanctuary cities and protecting these individuals. And they will not go and tell um, the police or tell anyone that here's these illegal immigrants. And when they go and get stopped by the police, they actually tell them, the Democrats actually tell them how to, uh, when the police are coming or when someone's coming after to, to uh, pick them up, when ICE is coming. So they actually try to tell them when they're coming and how to defend themselves. Here's the thing, they came here to our country illegally. They didn't come here legally. And, and why did they come here legally? What is the reason why they came? Did they come to prosper America or did they try to come to hinder America? Did they come to try to, did they bring diseases over to America? Are they coming to human traffic? Because we have a lot of human traffickers and it's everywhere. It's here in Michigan, folks. It's everywhere. And we need to make sure that we take care of our American citizens and the 8th District people because that's what we're here for. That's what a congresswoman will do is protect the 8th District. So we need to build the wall continuing, and I would be more than happy to help myself go build the wall. But it's not about, you know, the families and hurting the families or anything of that nature, because I keep hearing about the families have to stick together, the families have to stick together. Well, I have to say this, folks. Um, when my criminal clients, and some of them have to go to prison, they don't get to bring their families with them. They don't get to bring their spouse. They don't get to bring their kids. And so... When they bring, and what people don't realize when they, about these kids, these kids, when they come over, they're usually not their moms and dads that are bringing them over. It's human traffickers, it's other people. So we need to build the wall and we need to make sure that we fix this broken system that we have and get together with the Democrats to try to fix this. Thank you, Christina, and thank you all. Uh, this is gonna go back around, halfway around the world, so we're gonna go away from the border and go back to, um, the Mideast, or go to the Mideast. Um, what should our role be in the Mideast? And we'll start with Alan Hoover, who might have some on-the-ground experience. Okay, so I've been in the Middle East three deployments, and in three different capacities in those, in those, in those deployments. With that, I like the enabler route. What does an enabler do? An enabler is a soldier or Marine that's sent abroad to train 
the troops of that country. Because at the end of the day, I don't want to see Americans dying for other countries' wars. So we send our enablers over there, they train those countries' personnel, and then that country's soldiers go and they fight their war. It's, all, it's just the same thing about giving and t a fish versus teaching someone how to catch a fish. We don't want to keep sending our Americans to other countries to die for their, for their freedoms and liberties. Let's teach them how to defend themselves so that they can ensure their liberties and freedoms in whatever capacity that is. And on top of it, we, don't need, we cannot do it for free. We cannot put that on the American taxpayer because it's not free. The people working their, their jobs every day, their 40, 50, 60, 80 hours a week, they're the ones paying for that. So again, send enablers, make the countries pay for it, train them to fight their own battles so that way they can pursue whatever avenue of freedom it is that they desire. Thank you, Alan. Christina Like. I believe that what we need to do is we do need to teach the individuals over in the countries over in the Middle East to be able to defend themselves. But there are going to be certain times that we're actually going to have to go over there because there are threats sometimes that we don't foresee. Us Americans, and you know, we watch the news. You think the news knows every single detail, every security system that they don't. President Trump does, and and hopefully, you know, I mean, once in a while we get some leakers, but the thing of it is, is that they're usually wrong um, on the leaking the information. But the point is, is this, is that we don't know what's all going on. So it's very hard for us to guesstimate or estimate what we should do until we actually get all of what's going on in that country and make a decision. It's kind of like what I do in a case when I don't know all the facts that are going on at that time period, I take the time, research the issue, make sure I have all the facts to go into, and I call it war sometimes in trial, but when I go into trial, I make sure I have all that information so I can be the best um, prepared um, and make sure I'm as efficient as possible and effective, because that's what we need to do when making decisions for our, for our country and for the 8th District. Thank you. And how about Nikki? Conflict in the Middle East has always been and always will be. Terrorism is a very real threat. It needs to be fought head on. I appreciate some of the other suggestions we've talked about, but I, I, it's a relentless effort that we're going to have to stick with. Uh, another thing that related to this topic is just the notion that we do need to be very clear that an attack on U.S. Embassy is an attack on U.S. soil, no matter where you're at and we're, go we're going to fight back. Thank you, and Paul Young. I'll, I'll keep it brief here. I've, I've kind of offered some thoughts on this in a general way, but it, we, anytime you're gonna deploy American forces abroad, put America first. We don't need to be involved in nation building. And I might just make one observation about conflict in the Middle East that's different today than it would have been for most of the last 30 or 40 years, and that is energy independence in the United States of America. The fact that for instead of for the last 30 or 40 years where we were importing oil and energy resources, we now export that. And that has a lot to do with President Trump's willingness to allow uh, exploration for oil, a willingness to build pipelines, pipelines that were blocked by the Obama administration. Allowing America to be an energy producer and an energy exporter reduces the pressure that we face to get involved in the Middle East, which is a source of energy. So let's put America first, let's not nation build, and let's be thankful that we are now an energy exporter. Thank you, Paul, and thank you all for those interesting answers. Now we're gonna have two lightning round questions. Um, and I'll start with you, Paul. We'll put you right, right back on, the, uh, on camera. Um, would you vote for a national right to carry bill? Yes. Alan Hoover. Absolutely yes. Christina Light. Absolutely yes. And Nikki Snyder. Yes. And that's that was lightning. That was <laughs> terrific. <laughs> and uh, and how about um, what are your thoughts about a national freedom to work legislation, i.e., right to work? Um, and we'll start with Nikki Snyder. I love it. Christina. I think uh, that is a it's it's a good thing um, for America. But we also have to take into consideration um, other things. Um, but I, I believe it's a good thing. Paul. With just a brief pause for the idea that as a federal legislator, I'd prefer to allow states to regulate what they do in their states, mm -hmm. uh, my impulse would be to say, yes, people <laughs> should be allowed to work. <laughs> Alan Hoover. Yes, in America, American citizens should be able to get jobs. And as far as how those are regulated, I would, 
I would leave that to the states to make those decisions. Thank you all. And thank you for watching. This is On the Right Side with GOGOP. I'm Al Hassinger, Activities VP for the Greater Oakland Republican Club. At this point, we're not going to, uh, we're going to change it up a little bit, rather, and uh, have what we're going to call Vox Populi. And for those of you who are challenged in Latin, it's Voice of the People. And we're going to pass it over to Teresa Manjoli, who's a political VP for the Greater Oakland Republican Club. Teresa? Thank you so much, Al. Appreciate it and all the work that you've been doing so far in this evening. I've been uh, gathering questions from our audience members here in the room, as well as getting questions from people on, online. And so, but first, before we get to those, we are going to bring up a special guest. Uh, we have Chris Barnett, who is the Orion Township Super Supervisor with us this evening. As one of our local governments here, the home of GOGOP, we wanted to give him the chance to ask one of the first questions. And we will start with Christina, so get ready. Okay. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you, Al. And thank you, candidates. This is an amazing opportunity to engage with you and hear what you're thinking about for our district. So. Uh, in Oakland County, there are 10 townships, eight cities and villages that are part of the 8th Congressional District. I'm one of the supervisors. And uh, my questions are maybe unique to what you think, but uh, you might think I would ask. But first of all, um, the most recent poll at the federal level, confidence in people that are, that you're running for, the job you're running for is at 17 <laughs> percent, lowest it's been in our nation's history. So um, at the local level, we're a little bit higher in the 40s or 50s. Uh, depending on what community you're in. In Oregon, it's like 90. But anyway, um, <laughs> what are you going to do uh, to, to change that paradigm? And, and, the, and the reason I'm asking this question is because um, we need to hear from you. How are you going to connect with us, the local electeds specifically, and our residents, uh, if you are successful in D.C.? Thank you. That is a really good question. It's a pleasure meeting you tonight. But the one of the things that we're doing actually is we're going to local councils. Um, we go to Williamson City Council. We've done quite a few different city council meetings because we want to hear from you. We want to know what's going on in your city, your township, and we're actually getting to your, your township soon. But the point that we need to make is we need to hear from the people because that's who we represent. And I used to be a local, um, I used to be a trustee for the village of Pinckney when I was about 19 years old. And I actually um, rode around with the police to make sure that we needed to, because we were um, looking at giving them a raise. And I motioned to give them a raise, because at that time period they weren't making that much money. But I wanted to make sure that they were doing their job and doing other things that were appropriately. So I rode along with them on their midnight shift. And they were perfect. I was the first person to motion that. But I also worked for the state representative's office as well. And so that common ground with the people you need to have that. And a lot of times, when I'm on the campaign trail, I like to have confrontation, or not confrontation, excuse me, I like to talk the communication on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And I like to find out what are the issues in this township? What's the issues that you're having? And what are the struggles that you're having? And the other thing that we need to make sure, that I'm gonna make sure as a Congresswoman, I'm gonna tell you this. I have told many people that I have I grew up, a handshake is a handshake, okay? I grew up in a small town called Pinckney, and you have to have integrity. And so when I get to Washington, D.C., I'm gonna make sure I tell everyone that I have that integrity and look them straight in the eyes, and that I'm going to be honest with them and talk to them, and I'm gonna be honest with the people, our constituents, too. And I'm gonna make sure I come back to the district and ask them, I'm gonna be there four days a week, I'm gonna come here three days a week. Thank you. <laughs> I was cut off. <laughs> I'll, I'll be happy to jump in. You know, I, I've heard those statistics that people don't are very unsatisfied with Congress. I think it starts with how you campaign for the office. If you do what Alyssa Slotkin did and you suggest, oh, I'm not going to be all about impeachment. I'm going to work in a bipartisan manner. And as soon as you get to Washington, you start breaking those promises. You start governing in a way that's totally different than what you told the voters that you were going to do. That's a big part of the reason why people look at it and go, what do you do with these people? I've got no use for them. And of course, what I would urge all of you watching to do is get rid of Alyssa Slotkin. Let's make her a one-term member of Congress. And with your support, I'll help, uh, I'll help us do that. Another thing I can promise to you if you uh, select me as your next representative of Congress is I will listen to you. 
I would urge everyone watching to, to like my Facebook page. You can find my Facebook page at, at Paul Young for Congress. And in case you, it's been a little while, I'll spell my name for you again. It's J-U-N-G-E, but at Paul Young for Congress. And you can see that on a regular basis, I am all over this district. I am in Ingham County. I'm in Livingston County, and I'm here throughout those 10 townships in, uh, here in Oakland County, listening to voters at, at, at public events, walking in parades, participating in charitable events, attending township meetings. I will be listening to the voters so that I will represent their values, and I, I will suggest to you I have a great degree of confidence that more than 17%, even that very low bar, will be saying, I'm satisfied with the representation of conservative values that Paul Young is fighting for us in Washington, D.C. So, yes, 17%. I get it. That's part of the reason why I'm here. And I'm looking to bring, what, the values at the Marine Corps, the leadership principles and those traits that the Marine Corps instilled in me. Integrity, initiative, tact, courage, loyalty, things of that nature. Because at the end of the day, I think that the 8th District needs a Marine. Someone who understands the left and right lateral limits. That being the U.S. American citizen. A Marine's job is very simple. You go in, you destroy the enemy with indirect and direct fire. A U.S. representative's job is very simple. You listen to the American citizen within the district. I've already proven that I'm capable of being an outstanding Marine for 20 years. Now I want the opportunity, and I'm requesting the opportunity, to prove that I can be an outstanding U.S. representative as well. And what does that take? Going out and interacting with people. I knock on doors. I have a team, we go around, we knock on doors. I personally knock on doors. All over the district. I interact with the local politicians as well, see, see what they're trying to do to help their communities. Because at the end of the day, if we can turn the house back into a red house, we need to do what's gonna be best for the United States American citizens. So talking to the, to the politicians in the local level and also talking to the citizens in the district we're able to come up with a plan on what is it that we want to see so that we're not seeing our amendments and our rights being taken away. So I'd want to know more. I mean, 17% is pretty low. And, and we've suggested listening and, and touring the district, but really making relationships intimately and knowing people, what, what they're living through, what they do. Uh, being real and staying connected is going to be is going to be key. And I think that people really genuinely want to return civility to politics. They do. They don't want partisan showboats like we've seen with the impeachment. So, so that's definitely not something I'll bring to the office. Thank you. And a quick follow-up. I would just say I agree uh, that I think one of the keys we have several local elected officials in the audience tonight that we want to stay connected to you. Uh, we feel like we are the closest local level to the to our residents and to your the people that you represent. So we're hopeful that you'll do that. I want to have a very quick question, maybe a little longer than lightning, but electability. Uh, let's not BS each other here. This is going to be a really tough seat to win back. Uh, the last, uh, when Mike Bishop was beat, there was almost $38 million spent in this race. How will you reasonably and how do you expect to win election uh, in a very brief manner? How, how can you win? And then I'm, then I'm done. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks, Chris. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I have a lot of reasons why I think I'm our best opportunity to make this seat red again, but I'll offer just a couple. One, the House leadership in Washington, D.C. evaluates candidates, and if you meet certain criteria and you demonstrate that you can raise funds, they designate candidates a young gun on the radar. I am the only candidate in the 8th District that House leadership has said is a young gun on the radar. That's their view that I'm the most likely candidate who can win this district and, and make the House Republican again. And part of that function is, and probably many of us don't like it, but it is an ability to raise funds. Uh, we all have had an opportunity in the fourth quarter to raise funds. I've announced that I was able to raise over a quarter million dollars. And let me put this some perspective on this. Last time when uh, Alyssa Slotkin took this seat away from us, over $30 million was spent in this district. So that's just a start that I've got in that fundraising. But my ability to raise funds, the designation that's coming from people that I'm the candidate that can get this done, and finally, I am devoting myself full time to this effort. So I will work for you to win this district back. Okay, I love this question. And the reason why, again, there's, there's multiple reasons why. But I'm gonna start with this. Who's put their trust and confidence in me thus far? I've received personal endorsements from people such as Bob Lutz, 
Bob Lutz is an auto industry tycoon, and he's also a former Marine. I've received endorsements from retired Brigadier General Raich, who by and large has been a Democrat for the majority of his life, but he's endorsed me based on the values of a gunnery sergeant, knowing that I'm gonna bring those same principles into this, this election and then into the U.S. Congress, that being putting Americans first. Additionally, I've received endorsements from other retired Marine Corps colonels, vice presidents of other, of other companies within the 8th District, and then I've been going around and talking with people, my team, my, my, ten, my 10 core officers, they're out there with me working as well. Our, our onslaught of volunteers, we're all out there knocking on doors. And at the end of the day, when I sit down with Alyssa Slotkin, she's not going to be able to sit there and pretend to associate herself as, as being a veteran by association, because I'm going to call her out on it. Because at the end of the day, she was a political CIA analyst. At the same time, I was in Iraq with Michigan's 24th Marines. She's not going to be able to talk about playing ping pong and romancing an officer in Iraq with me sitting next to her talking about kicking in doors and making America great. So that's what it's about. You've got to put in the work. You've got to know what it is that you're, what you're fighting against. And at the end of the day, you don't send a lamb to fight a wolf. You send a lion. I'll just say one thing. I'm the only candidate up here who has won before. In 2016, I won with nearly two million votes with Trump at the top of the ticket. We made it red in 2016, and I think Trump and Snyder will make it red again in 2020. Thank you. First of all, no one, no one knew Alyssa, okay? Her house is in DC. Um, she's not even a, a part of our district. So she had to have that much money so that she would get known. And then we had the second problem, which was the marijuana problem, the marijuana proposal, and all the Democrats were getting all these students to go and vote and get out, get out there and, and vote for the marijuana proposal. And therefore, a vote for the marijuana proposal is a vote for slacking. So then we had the third thing, that Democrats focused on health care because we didn't get anything done about the health care issue. And the Democrats and Slotkin, they promised that we would get the health care fixed because we saw what a horrible situation that the Obamacare has created for us. So going back to why I'm going to be a, the greatest candidate here, because of the fact is I've lived here my entire life. I know, I've seen the struggles that the individual has faced. I have helped many people. I've helped the pro bono, I did pro bono work for veterans, and plus I can go and argue and litigate very, very well. And I know the issues of the families here. And I know that once I face Alyssa Slacken, I know that I will win. Thank you. Um, I had a follow up, but I'm gonna turn it over because I think there's a lot more questions. But I just wanted to say, each of you has my utmost gratitude in putting your lives on hold uh, to seek this office. So thank you on behalf of uh, me from Orion Township. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thank you very much, Chris. So at this point of the program, we're also changing the timing on the questions. More time? Less time, <laughs> unfortunately. And I will also be watching our timekeeper over here. So when that red sign goes up, I will be going on to the next speaker, whether you're in mid-sentence or not. So make sure you're getting your answers <laughs> concisely as possible. Um, so our first question that's coming from the audience is, how will you change the political atmosphere in Michigan as well as in D.C.? And we're going to start with Christina. I'm sorry, what was the question again? How will you change the political atmosphere in Michigan as well as in D.C.? I think the way that we need to change the political atmosphere here in Michigan is we need to go face to face to our neighbors and our friends and families and talk to them and talk about why the Republicans need to be back into office and why um, Alyssa Slotkin needs to be back or taken out of the district um, and not voted again in there. Um, we need to make sure that we're having these conversations at family tables and getting back to um, talking about the positives of the Republicans because people always think that Republicans are so negative and that we're all about money, 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 very much greedy, greedy, greedy. And the issue is, is that we got to make sure that we look at the Republicans as positive, because that's what we are. We're positive people. We make solutions. We do our job, and we do it well. Thank you. Paul. Uh, I'll give just two parts of the answer. First is, and I, I talked about this before, uh, when you say, when you run for office and say you'll do things, why don't you actually do them? 
that will help with civility. We'll, we'll not get cynical and, and unhappy and disgusted, quite frankly, with politicians who say, I'm not about impeachment. I'll work in a bipartisan fashion. And then instead you lead the impeachment charge and then instead you vote 90% of the time with the squad. So when I campaign, when I tell you I'm going to do things, that's what I'll do. And on, on the, uh, the second point I would make is, is let's deal with the issues. Let's not make personal attacks. Let's not smear people for reasons that have nothing to do with policy in Washington. I will focus on the conservative issues that matter to the people of the 8th District. Jobs in the economy, protecting your work provided health care, protecting Medicare, securing the border, enforcing immigration law and focus on those issues and do it in a civil way, even with, with anyone with whom I disagree, those would be two, two lead points in returning civility to politics. Okay. Alan. Number one, restoring your voice as the American citizen. Look, at the end of the day, U.S. representatives are supposed to represent American citizens. So in doing that, it's going to, it's, it's going to skew this whole thing. It's real simple. U.S. representative, represent the American citizen. Restore your voice in Congress. That is what I want to do. I want to take your voice and I want to take it to Congress. That's it, it's simple, restore your voice. Great, Nikki? I think the single most important thing to do is, is send somebody who has the ability to make relationships. That's key, I think politicians have been, you know, just throwing fireballs at each other for years. We've gotten to a place where now we can't even look at each other. We don't even want to be in the same room with each other. That's a problem. We need to send somebody who has the ability to make relationships. Christina. I already, oh. already answered. Okay. So, <laughs> I'll answer me, again, though, if you'd like. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> so let me follow up on the question, um, because, Nikki, you bring up building relationships. And um, the question I'll start it with, Alan, is what, do you, what skills do you have that will enable you to build bipartisan relationships in D.C.? All right. So I've been a union worker. I've been management. I've been an engineer worked in, in product development. I've also been an enabler. Three successful tours as an enabler. What does an enabler do? They go to other countries, they work with, as they, they work with the people in the other countries, whether that's their military or the, the people that represent their country. And what is it? You build a relationship, you build a rapport, you find a common interest, and then you figure out ways to, to complete and to accomplish that common interest. So at the end of the day, was 122 bills presented to the floor from, uh, from the, the lower chamber of the House over for this last election when Slocken won. And she voted yes, co-sponsored, or sponsored them herself, presented them herself. At the end of the day, I'm not gonna vote yes on the 122 bills. I think there was like eight that I was, <coughs> that I was even somewhat interested in. At the end of the day, yes, you need to create relationships to get things done. But the priority here is putting the American citizen first, making sure that their tax dollars aren't increasing, making sure that their dollars aren't being thrown into some other fire that's never gonna end. So if that means, if that means that I can't get someone to come on board because they wanna increase taxes, they wanna take more of your money, then at the end of the day, I have to stay on the ground and putting my people first, my constituents first in the state of Michigan, in the eighth district. So I will do my best to work with those who want to put Americans first in America. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Nikki. Experience and commitment, bringing experience in major areas that we need to work together with healthcare and education, those are my two main wheelhouses. But commitment, there's something pretty core to making relationships work, and that's that keep trying. That's that stay engaged, don't give up kind of thing. And I think that we've sort of walked away from those basic core realities to strong relationships. Okay. Christina. Thank you. I've been a litigator um, for the last past five, 15 years. And as a trial litigator, um, I fight for my clients, but I also advocate for them as well. But there are times that you actually have to know when to back off. And our experiences, my experience is this, is that I need to go and talk to that prosecutor. I need to go talk to that individual and actually sit down with them and say, okay, well, here's your issue on this, here's my issue on this. Somewhere we have to meet in the middle. And you might have to give something up and I might have to give something up, but we need to make a solution so it fits the family. And we do this a lot in family law because I'm also a mediator too um, for um, family law and for, excuse me, for civil law. And as a mediator, we have to actually look at 
how are we going to facilitate this mediation? How are we actually going to make um, everyone, not make them agree, but get them to agree at the table? And it's all about um, trying to sit down with them and having a calm conversation and not yelling at them and cussing at them and calling them names and not being diverse towards each other. Paul. Um, let me give an example. Before I worked in the Trump administration in Washington, D.C., I worked on Capitol Hill. I was an investigative counsel for Chuck Grassley, the Republican from Iowa. And the ranking, the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee was Patrick Leahy, a very uh, liberal from Vermont. And uh, Senator uh, Grassley and Senator Leahy and their staffs worked together on a problem uh, with the FBI crime lab. There had been a problem 15, 20 years ago where bad science and, and uh, technicians had uh, testified in a way that just wasn't supported by the science or the actual evidence in the case. And working together across the aisle on Capitol Hill, we rooted that problem out and helped move the FBI towards fixing some problems there. And as a former prosecutor, let me tell you, I wanted to win cases, but I never wanted to put an innocent person in jail. So working across the aisle, cooperating with others, we were able to help bring reform to the federal government and reform that made the difference in people's lives. So I've done that. Great, all right, so Paul, we're gonna stay with you on okay. this question. Um, the question coming from the audience is on the EPA. And a lot of, frequently the Republicans don't have a very strong conservative background, it's a conservation background in environmental issues. However, we also know that the EPA has made some very strong regulations that are limiting our businesses. So what would you do as far as change, making changes at the EPA that would limit their regulations and the burden on our manufacturing companies as well as trying to preserve our environment? Well, Teresa, I'm going to start by uh, objecting a little bit to the, the way you posed the question. I know it's not you. It, it came from maybe the internet. Uh, maybe it was a Democrat who posed that question because I reject the notion that Republicans don't have a conservation background I reject the notion that Republicans don't care about the water that we drink and that the air that we breathe I, I absolutely believe from the roots of Teddy Roosevelt through Richard Nixon who established the Environmental Protection Agency that the Republicans have a proud tradition of preserving our natural resources and defending American life and, uh, and American health uh, but I also think Republicans have a sensible approach uh, and they, they are trying to achieve those goals in the most cost efficient way and in a way that won't bankrupt people, throw people out of jobs unnecessarily. So I think, I think the, the reason American people should trust Republican leadership at the EPA or anywhere is that we will focus on what the problem is, solve that problem and not grandstand and showboat to pretend that we care more than someone else does at the cost of jobs and at the cost of taxpayer money. So, uh, so no, I think, I think Republican leadership, we will preserve the environment and, and keep jobs. So what would changes would you make at the EPA? Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I read, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, there was a, something I read just recently that the Trump administration is, uh, is working on. I know, I know in the Obama administration they, they were expanding, and I'm forgetting the exact details of this, but the waterways. So that if there was a puddle on a farmer's land, that you now were gonna have federal regulation and farmers who were gonna do rational things to, to create drainage and take care of livestock, they were prevented by federal regulation. So I mean, that might be just one example of, of, of not, you know, not grandstanding to grab federal power, but instead being rational and actually addressing and solving a problem. Thank you, so Alan. All right, so one, it needs to be based off of legitimate science, okay? We have, what, the New Green Deal, which then is climate change, which before that was global warming. Look, I just read this book the other day called uh, Climate Gate. It was talking about how scientists, 10,000 emails, uh, bullying other scientists that had very data that was contrary to theirs. At the end of the day, when we're passing laws and policies in the United States, one, it needs to be fair across the board, all right, to so everybody involved. Two. It needs to be based off of sound science. Like the data that's coming up with these, with these regulations, it needs to be sound science and it needs to be limited as much as possible. Yes, we need clean drinking water. Yes, we need clean air. Absolutely. However, we need to do it in a manner that's not gonna cripple our industry and not gonna cause American citizens to see a dent in their paycheck or a, a, a reduction in their labor. Great, thank you. Nikki? I would echo some of the same things they've said, but I grew up in the UP, I love Michigan's natural resources. Uh, 
I come from a family of hunters. My grandma, in particular, takes the cake for the best buck. So, you know, in, in that, baked into that experience really is learning how to love natural resources. So I utterly reject the concept that I wouldn't want to take care of them as well. Uh, EPA, deregulate, definitely deregulate in that area. Uh, it's a huge issue for the state of Michigan, which leads in manufacturing. Most of our manufacturing businesses are small businesses. This is going to hurt jobs, it's, it's a significant issue. And we haven't just seen it that, oh, hey, all of a sudden businesses don't want to partake in, in the cleanup, if you will, of, of what happens. It's just that the bar keeps getting higher and higher. And that's related to taxes, essentially. It's like a tax that they pay, if you will. So it just keeps, it keeps coming out of the bottom line. It's not a positive thing. Okay, thank you. Christina. Thank you. I think that we can all agree on, I think the Democrats and Republicans, if they sat down, I'm trickling back to the other question that we had, but if we sat down, we could all agree that we want clean air. We all can agree that we want clean water. We want to make sure our environment is safe for our children. In fact, on my campaign trail, you know, a lot of people, you know, explained to me, we need to um, have more recycling and things of that nature. So when people indicate that Republicans don't care about the environment, that's just not true at all because, I mean, we just saw President um, Trump with um, the tree situation about um, having growing more trees. Um, he signed that into law. I thought that was fabulous. But where was that on the news? We didn't hear about that. We didn't hear about that at all. So if we don't hear about this stuff, it makes the Republicans not look good. And it, it, makes, just, uh, it makes us look like we don't care about the environment. And that's just not true at all because most of us have family and friends and, and kids and dogs, and we want to make sure that we have clean air and clean water for those, for those uh, family members of ours. Okay. Um, am I wrapping it up? Yes, you're wrapping it up. <laughs> <laughs> because I am also getting the high sign from our production crew that we are getting close to the end of tonight, and they've given me uh, the chance to do one, maybe two questions, depending on how quickly you can answer these for me. <laughs> so, uh, starting with Alan, um, would you support ending national funding for public radio and television? Yes or no? The NPR. NPR, yes. So, huh. They are here, by the way, so just. Yes, <laughs> so. <laughs> growing up in poverty, being a poor kid, I didn't have cable television, that was a luxury. Okay. But I did have a black and white TV, in which case I was able to watch things like Mr. Rogers and, and PBS and all that other stuff. And because of that, it gave me an insight as, as a child that I wouldn't have got without seeing those things. Because, I mean, we're talking, that, we're talking about some of the worst parts of our state, unfortunately, that I experienced growing up as a child. So, no, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to discredit those. I wouldn't want to see those go away. I would like to encourage other corporations and companies, though, to, to see the value that comes out of having something like that. Maybe getting involved, making some contributions so that these companies can, can flourish. Because at the end of the day, look, look at someone like me. Came from nothing. I mean, I work a 40-hour job. I'm running for Congress. I'm still in the Marine Corps Reserves. And I'm working on my MBA right now with a 3.95 GPA. I mean, how do you, why would you not want someone with that work ethic working in your company? this was an avenue to reach me when I was a child. Okay, great. I'm going to go to Paul. When I was a kid, there were four television stations and there was no internet. Today, there are hundreds of thousands of cable channels and you can find anything you want on the internet. And uh, So with, with apologies to the uh, public radio employee in the audience, I'm afraid I would end taxpayer subsidies for that. We'll, we'll do just fine with a free market providing information to people. Great. Christina? I would go back to the budget. We need to make sure that we're looking at our budget because we have such a big deficit right now. And so if that would be part of cutting the fat, then I would be all for ending the funding of national radio because um, we can actually find different ways of funding this radio. Okay, and Nikki. I would echo the last two answers, but with, with the caveat that, you know, I'm not sitting here saying yay jobs, but I want you to lose yours. I, I definitely feel like uh, as we move forward, it's not just politicians that need to increase civility. Uh, we need to partner. Great. All right. So our last question, we're going to start with Christina. Um, would you support term limits for Congress? I would. Okay. Nikki. That was short, right? <laughs> yes. Alan. Absolutely, yes. And Paul. 
I think my answer is no. I don't think I intend to make a long career of serving in Congress should I win your support, but uh, I think there's something to be said for service, and uh, I, I, I would hesitate before I'd say let's amend the Constitution. Uh, it just, there's, a, there's some mischief there. So then I'm going to give you a follow-up question on that one. Would you support giving Congress a raise um, before the national debt is addressed? Uh, well, that's pretty easy, no. Christina? Absolutely no. Nikki? No. And Alan? Absolutely not. <laughs> okay. With that, we've gone through the questions that we have with the time that's allotted, and I'm going to turn it back over to Al to wrap up for the rest of the program. So thank you very much. And I also want to make sure I thank our audience participants for your questions this evening, as well as those of uh, the people that were online who submitted them as well. So thank you very much. And thank you, Al. Teresa. And thank you all. <coughs> excuse me. Thank you all for watching, and thank our studio audience. I'm Al Hassinger. Activities VP for Greater Oakland Republicans. And this is On the Right Side with GOGOP. At this point, we're going to give the candidates a little more time to wrap things up and allot them three minutes each. And I'm going to use what we now call the Manjoli rule. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and let you wrap up with a little bit longer take on you and why you would like to represent us in the 8th District in Washington, D.C. And um, I'm going to go with Nikki first and we'll work our way across. Nikki, you have three minutes and we're going to stick to three. Okay. The why of why I'm running for Congress is pretty basic and simple. There are two reasons. I love my kids and I love my country. I'll circle back around to the things that I stand for. I stand for conservative values, including lower taxes, limited government, pro-Second Amendment support, and I am one of the most passionate pro-life Republican women you will meet. We didn't get to talk about that topic tonight, but I do very much passionately discuss that topic. Uh, I really believe that this election is about turning Michigan red again in 2020. Trump and Nikki Snyder did that in 2016. We can and will do it again. We need to take back our 8th district seat. I'm one of the most qualified to talk about opposing Medicare for All, which is a significant part of my wheelhouse. I will go to D.C. and fight for you in that area. We need to continue to protect freedom in education, which is something that I'll continue to do, as I've done as a State Board of Education member. And I will always support free market and local control solutions. These are just basic parts of who I am that will never go away. And I will not raise taxes to solve a problem that we have. Thank you. Christina Lank. Thank you. First of all, the reason why I'm running is because I love America. I, if I could bleed red, white, and blue, I would. I, I, I love America. Um, I love what it stands for. I love our freedoms. It's sad that the reason why I'm running is number one, I do love my country, but number two is I'm a huge Second Amendment uh, um, proponent. I was born, well, I was raised by my father who taught me all about the Second Amendment and I was very grateful for him to um, teach me all about the Second Amendment. Um, I used to go shooting with him when I was a kid. I had my first gun when I was six years old. I learned the First Amendment through my mother. We used to go to church every single Sunday, Wednesday, and I also went to youth group ministry. I was the uh, treasurer there at the um, church. I'm the only candidate that has resided in the 8th district their entire life. I have actually seen the struggles of individuals during the Obama era, the time periods that we actually saw how much health care was and how much it affected these parents and what is going on now, we still haven't fixed that problem. And that's the reason why I, I wanna fix that problem. But I also wanna make sure that no one takes our gun rights away. We hear, keep hearing about our freedoms and liberties. Those are what are being taken away each day that we have an individual like a Democrat in. And then the other thing is, I'm a Christian and pro-life, okay? I have always served individuals in my community in the 8th District. I have given pro bono cases to veterans. I have made sure that the, um, I volunteered for the students for MSU and Cooley. I have talked to different um, individuals about how to get their lives back on track because they're an alcoholic or rehabilitation. I listen 
to individuals and I've helped individuals all my life and I've served them and I want to be a public servant for you. That's the reason why I'm running for Congress. It's not about me. It's because I have a love for this country and I have a love for this 8th District in Michigan. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Paul Young. Well, Al, thank you. Uh, and let me start by thanking the Greater Oakland GOP, GOGOP. Thank you for putting on this program tonight. Thank you for everyone here in the studio audience who's taken uh, your time this evening to watch. And thank you to those of you watching uh, at home. Thank you for your time and your, uh, this opportunity to introduce myself and the other people here on the panel. Let me also make a promise, uh, a, pro a promise like all others that I'll keep. Uh, I'll keep my comments to less than three minutes. Uh, my name is Paul Young. I spell my last name J-U-N-G-E. If you select me to be the candidate to make Alyssa Slotkin a one-term member, I will make every effort and make sure that happens because we need to make the House Republican again. As I run for Congress, I hear the disgust across this district with a candidate who made promises to behave in one way and then behaved in a different way when she went to Washington, D.C. If you send me to Washington, I will fight for the conservative values that I'm hearing uh, people want to champion for, fighting for our jobs and the economy, fighting for, to secure our border and enforce immigration law, fighting to keep our, uh, maintain our health care and not take it away with some government takeover program. Uh, please follow me. I have a Facebook page, at Paul Young for Congress. You can find out more about me at my website, paulyoung.com. We need to make Alyssa Slotkin a one-term member of Congress. We need to re-elect President Trump. We need to make the House Republican again, and with your support, I'll, we can get that done. Thank you. And thank you, Paul. Alan Hoover. First of all, I want to say thank you to everyone in attendance, and to the viewers at home, I want to thank you for taking time out of your day and your busy lives to listen to us and our message. Now, with that, yes, I'm Alan Hoover, and I am running for Congress. Now, I'm a hard worker, and it's proven. I came from nothing, and I built myself into a middle-class life through hard work and dedication. Additionally, yes, I served in the Marine Corps for 20 years, five deployments, 19 operations. I have those leadership principles, I have those leadership traits, and I have that philosophy. You hear a lot of politicians saying that they're going to do all these things for you, and then, they, and then you elect them, and then they don't necessarily do it. At the end of the day, I am promising you I'm going to restore your voice. You send me to Congress, I'm going to ensure that your Second Amendment right is not infringed upon. I'm going to fight to make sure that your freedom of speech is not infringed upon. Look, the person that I am running against, Alyssa Slotkin, she sent $150 billion. She was complicit in it. Over to Iran, which then ended up funding General Soleimani, as well as terrorism globally. That is not something that Alan Hoover will do. She likes to paint herself as being a veteran through association as when she was a CIA political analyst. I am a veteran. I fought for this country. She is not. I will call her out on it. She will not be able to stand in front of us, us being the American citizens, and say that she is a veteran through association. Additionally, when 2015, when we were able to have Israel take out Soleimani, Iran tipped them off. Alyssa Slotkin was a part of that, was involved in that in a capacity as well. Look, at the end of the day, her family had a farm in Holly. I lived in a shelter in Holly. She was going to Ivy League schools on the East Coast when 9-11 happened. I was a private in the United States Marine Corps in my chuck standing over ground zero, looking to see what I was getting ready to go to war for. And now, She's here talking about dereliction of duty. She doesn't know what dereliction of duty is because she's never served in the capacity of the Department of Defense from a perspective of being a veteran. You see her saying that she wants to take away the war powers from the president, but yet it was okay for the previous administration that she served with to send over 500 rockets to take out enemies under that administration. But yet when our embassy was attacked, in Benghazi in 2012, when I was in Africa, a part of the Special Purpose Marine Air Ground Task Force that could have responded and kept that atrocity from happening, that kept our ambassador from dying, that administration that she was involved with, they said, no, don't go. But yet we see President Trump, one of our embassies is attacked. He says, go the same day. At the end of the day, we need to send people that are gonna stand up for the American citizen. All right, I'm Alan Hoover, I'm running for Congress, and I need your support. Thank you, Alan. 
<clears throat> and thank you all of our candidates for the 8th District for joining us tonight. I'm Al Hassinger. This is On the Right Side with GOGOP. We are, are part of the, we are the Republican Club in Oakland County. And you can check out our website at www.gogop.club. I want to thank our studio audience and also everybody who's tuning in. And please join us again for another one of these roundtables and join us at any GOGOP meeting the second Tuesday of every month at Canterbury Village. Thank you very much. And vote. <laughs> <laughs>